Hello everyone, today we talk about the Longobard army. We're gonna take a look essentially, a bit very broadly actually, because this is an introductory video, at the nature of the Longobard armed forces. Um, in this period comprehended really between, chiefly between the 6th and the 8th century, albeit actually the Longobard military history stretches also before, quite interestingly, and, and later even more interestingly by certain standards up to the 11th century up to the Norman conquest um, it's um, it, it's a topic that in that in this sense today I would like to address um, in an introductory way as was saying but also looking a bit comprehensively at everything so not going into great detail doing to everything um, I'm saying this because I'm mm, thinking from some time to essentially make a series of videos dedicated to the Longobards based on the chapters of my uh, bachelor thesis that I wrote actually about the long Longobard military history and that can be interesting because I can uh, make uh, even a bit shorter videos but um, you know with a, m with a more um, condensated um, information uh, relatively to certain specific topics and I still have to to see whether these chapters are interesting in this sense because there would be also a bit um, about a bit longer about history in in general not just about military history focusing on that but also obviously talking about uh, the politics um, and not just the, the in society and not just the military which is something that we are doing uh, telling the truth also today because obviously you can't explain especially at this time in history you know with Mm, we, we first of all, as for most mm, Romano-Germanic kingdoms, uh, we have a very few informations overall uh, compared to other um, other periods. Obviously, uh, we um, um, there are certain characteristics that definitely made the Longobards mm, similar to any other Romano-Germanic kingdom. Others that obviously instead made them a bit more unique. Um, but in, in the essentials, politically and socially speaking, we're talking about mm, systems that worked in, in similar fashion compared to others. Mm. Especially p before the current before Carolingian times, you can argue that the world Western Europe, let's say the Latin Germanic Europe, was pretty similar in the essentials, those old military uh, organization and so on. Um, so, um, apparently you might think there is a few to say, um, but if you scratch into you know uh, down um, and get past the surface, you realize there are also many other things that inter interestingly pop out. Um, as some of you have uh, probably already noticed, I made um, a um, playlist dedicated to Longobard history. So not just um, Longobard, the Longobard military. Um, and this is being done because I believe I um, I believe Longobard history is uh, dramatically overlooked. Um, I, I believe all early medieval history is dramatically overlooked, but it happened to me to to know something more about Longobards, and therefore I I was kind of uh, disappointed by uh, how much neglected they they are. Mm. Uh, all the attention usually gets polarized that around the Franks, which is fair because objectively the Merovingian um, Empire, or kingdom as you want to call it, was actually an empire. Um, was definitely uh, more, uh, up to a certain point at least, more, uh, it was a bigger thing. It was something that, even in terms of sheer size, this is important, had no equals in, in, in Latin Germanic Europe. Sometimes the attention gets also polarized about the Anglo-Saxons, because you know, living in, in a Western world dominated by the Anglosphere and having, you know, the, uh, um, uh, the Anglo-Saxon culture having produced much about itself um, uh, historiographically speaking, so we there is this general attention towards the Anglo-Saxons, but as a matter of fact the Anglo-Saxons are probably the least documented people, I think, after the Scandinavians and the, um, and the Slavs are really some of the, at least sticking to Western Europe, um, some of the peoples we, we know the least. Uh, in this Mediterranean Europe, uh, talking about Italy, talking about Spain, actually we are mm, relatively better documented. We have enough um, um, 
sources about longer periods that are also very interesting and easily accessible um, <clears throat> by certain standards, and yet people do not care. May many people people don't even have a clear picture of what uh, um, Latin Germanic Europe was, of like Western Europe was during early medieval times. They tend to dim it in general, so it's a dark period at this moment in which everything was ooh, so dark and terrible, and everybody was everything was so tough. Instead, in the other epochs, everything was seemingly so much better for some reason. I'm not making relativism, of course, early medieval times were a bit more primitive, um, but this doesn't necessarily mean that there was better or worse. The average European at this point lived probably better than what it did in, in, in the 14th century, for instance. Um, <coughs> considering that the average European was a peasant, and looking at the condition of peasants, really, it was arguably not cent for cent sure about this, but let's say that, that there was a bit more freedom into uh, early medieval times than in towards the late Middle Ages, for instance, but this is not important. Um, <coughs> but in general, I think the, it, uh, what I'm trying to say is the longer birds um, wi within this already underestimated, overlooked period are unjustifiably overlooked. If anything, for how you know well they're documented compared to some other major Latin Germanic kingdoms. Um, <coughs> secondly, also because objectively they had a dramatic importance um, in uh, in European history, in many ways, um, not just for the history of the Apennine Peninsula, uh, not just for the fact that uh, you know they had this kind of particular relations with the Franks that even after the Co Carolingian conquest made uh, the Italic Kingdom something it was the Longobard Kingdom um, something say important for the Carolingians, even at an institutional level, they drew heavily also in, ad in the administrative practice from here and so on, but also because it was one of the few peoples that kind of lived up to the uh, 11th century, albeit not in a unitary way, because after the Carolingian conquest, the, the biggest chunk of uh, of the Longobards was uh, was taken out as, as an autonomous political um, entity. Yet you have these um, southern longbirds that lived on up to the Norman conquest that happened, in fact, in uh, a bit before actually than than the Norman conquest of England. But you know they made it up up to the the eleventh century, so it's roughly comparable. And there is practically no other population that kind of lived on with this uh, this kind of um, a very strong identity that lived on through the uh, centuries. The Longobards are characterized, among any, many other things, that uh, by the fact they felt at all times to have this Germanic tradition, doesn't matter how much they had changed, the fact that they had sedentarized um, and blended in, into the uh, Italian population, um, they always uh, they were extremely influential and they managed to keep this very strong identity um, um, feeling that objectively, aside from perhaps, you know, it wasn't so strong as, as in the rest of Western Europe for many reasons. Talking about the Longobard military finally, so this was a bit of an introduction, excuse me if I digressed a little bit, but it's, it's always nice to make a presentation and to stress the importance of certain things, in my opinion, because that might be also more interesting, it can be uh, sparkle more curiosity. I don't. I don't really know. Before I start, I drink l a little bit. Excuse me. Yeah. So here we go. So and as I was saying before, um, today we'll mostly start from the sixth century. So, actually, the Longobards had their military organization was pretty similar. Now to um, you know, the Longobards are witnessed. Um, historically, at least since the, uh, with certainty, I mean as such, by the Roman sources mm, when um, the Romans conquered Germany under under Tiberius. Uh, they um, they were found on the Elbe River when the Romans uh, conquered those places and uh, we have this first mention, but we have reasons to um, to to think that the um, the Longobards as such existed, or at least they had arrived as this group from Scandinavia, allegedly, but it's it's likely, telling you the truth, um, around uh, 100 BC. Mm -hmm. So they were actually also relatively new people in Germany, mm -hmm. and they were pretty warlike. They had this uh, str very strong core identity based on war, 
they were the um, um, they were conceiving themselves as longbirds as adoptive sons of Woden. They basically voted themselves to this um, mil f extremely fierce military attitude that it was noticed basically by anyone who uh, who was writing about them. Chiefly, the Romans who also said how basically among the Germanic pe m tribes, these the longbirds were mm, uh, little in number at least in the beginning, but being uh, mm, extremely violent and that took pride essentially by making a scorched and uh, all around the, the place where they lived and, f and being at war um, um, at once with all their neighbors. So, you know, if you were a neighbor of the Longbirds, you would not, <laughs> would not have been very happy about it. Um, and this very strong military um, tradition was deeply felt also um, as a matter of Germanic identity, at this point, for whatever it meant, naturally there is um, a great debate that I addressed, maybe if you go into my migration era playlist, um, or also in these uh, videos I already made about longbirds, I discuss a bit what, what does Germanic mean now, because um, the most extreme, but probably not excessively um, pushed theories now say that essentially names as, you know, cons concepts as the one of Celts or Germans were practically created by the classical sources to define certain populations that are might having objectively something in common. They were not extremely aware about the, the, their own um, common identity. I'm a bit more skeptical because there is a debate whether also um, whether certain populations were practically uh, of Germanic origin or not. And um, especially in the case of the Longobards today, there are uh, scholars who tend to consider these populations not just as Germanic, but something like Sarmato-Germanic. Um, just like the Vandals, for instance, are conceived to be kind of Slavic-Germanic, um, or, or something like that. Um, and the problem is we know nothing about this, because we don't have the actual, and we will pro very likely never have to have the actual proof of what you know these populations were practically about genetically speaking but from a sheer s historical point of view it doesn't even matter because these um, central and eastern European lands were so mixed at a certain point that um, this is not important and when we call these populations like we can say these were the Longobards actually these were groups sometimes we call them confederations sometimes mm, other people stick to tribes um, I think peoples uh, is better, in my opinion, as a term. It's kind of more uh, fluid, more flexible, um, and um, in my opinion, uh, uh, um, excuse me, uh, I was not saying my opinion. Um, this was the peoples that is a better term, in my opinion. But what is saying is, um, these populations basically stuck to this core, hmm, this traditional identity core of the origins that probably, in origin, corresponded to a um, <coughs> to a people. We don't really know because what we know from the longer birds is actually that um, these were, mm, yeah, consistent groups of pop that came out of Scandinavia at a certain point with a very strong military character at the beginning, or maybe that they got during the way because of this extreme, you know, this quite turbulent ger German situation on the continent. But whatever it was, the point is that this. The, the numbers of the Longobards that eventually, the ones who entered in Italy, were pretty consistent, were one of the greatest, my, you know, amount, group of peoples that ever migrated during the migration era. Uh, and there weren't excessively many, objectively. There were something between, today we think roughly one, there were realistically 100,000 people that, however, were a lot. Um, some people say even 300,000, people say less. I think 100,000 is, is okay. But these numbers were basically collected all along the way of the, that Longbirds um, made from um, from Scandia, allegedly, but you know, especially from this region of the uh, Bardengau in Germany on the Low Elbe River when the Romans also found Longbirds initially. And then eventually, basically coming up. Um, Coming, coming, excuse me, uh, south towards south along the Elbe River, and they reached um, these areas of Central Europe, uh, today's um, Moravia, or also the the uh, essentially the Danubian basin where they settled, and eventually from there, in 568, at least the, the largest block of this population migrated into Italy, when they where they settled, um, chiefly. Um, into the Po Valley, but also spreading actually um, throughout all the Apennine uh, and uh, up to the south. And they, 
in the sense their history is that eventually became the history of the kingdom that was founded in there and as we've seen uh, also from those other videos was something extremely uh, a new to the Longobards because the Longobards had this um, character of being essentially extremely um, egalitarian in nature. Probably there were, uh, at that point, at least among the, the populations who settled into the lands of the former Roman Empire, the one who had the least Romanization and that um, man was able to maintain uh, this kind of this uh, completely Germanic character. Perhaps just the Anglo-Saxons were something like that, but the Anglo-Saxons have also yeah, they have something in common with the Longbirds, objectively. Also, Longbirds were pretty uh, akin to the Saxons, as as far as we know. Um, actually, a group of Longbirds remained into Saxony, um, in into you know while the the largest part of the people migrated. So the Longbirds actually left uh, groups of um, of population scattered all over the uh, also uh, Western you know Central Europe, um, and they. Um, uh, in this sense, they, uh, however, the, the biggest block went into the Italian Peninsula, but they had this kind of, and they were a king of the Saxons. In fact, in 468, there were uh, allegedly uh, 20,000 Saxons also migrating into Italy with the Longobards. And seemingly, uh, by the way, you have to, rem to remember, this po Germanic population um, always had this perception that whatever they ident comprehensive identity was, they, they were still akin to each other. So you don't have to think these guys went to Italy, into Spain or wherever and they cut their relation with, I don't know, with Scandinavia. Because these guys had all quite clear in mind that they came from all that stock essentially. And in part this was a, a bit of a um, an awareness they started acquiring in fact by getting Romanized because the Romans had basically formulated that concept that everybody has pulled out of Scandinavia that they were all kind of the Germans as such, so there were also these kind of um, strange, I mean strange, but say I would say fascinating dynamics, however there was always very strong contact, the Longbirds kept contact with the Anglo-Saxon court, uh, with the Franks especially, um, and there was a very great um, you know, contact between these Germanic populations, so even this idea of considering um, early European times as this moment in which nobody uh, knew about anything about the rest of the world, that nobody traveled, nobody talked. And this is rubbish in historical terms. Today, I think you can't objectively pass an exam on the migration era by uh, stating such a thing. Uh, uh, but um, the, um, the the main point I was making is the, the Longbirds were great, um, I don't even know how to call them, um, they they had a, a great um, predisposition for assimilation, for integration, absorption of other elements. When when the Saxons went together with the Longobards in Italy, um, the Longobards tried essentially to incorporate them uh, within their population. Uh, these refused because it equated basically to lose their tribal identity and to obey to the laws of the Longobards becoming ro uh, Longobard subjects, um, and um, and they came back to to Saxony as a matter of fact. So you know, we are talking about the 6th century, and these populations, when they had the chance, were perfectly capable of making these travels across Europe. It was never something so strange. The Longbirds took uh, centuries for making their, you know, for in their for carrying out their journey from Saxony to Italy. And obviously, this doesn't mean that it's because it's as low as they they went. It's simply not. Uh, they moved only on the basis of what the uh, surrounding populations were behaving, either fighting against them, um, the Longobard crushed populations like the Herli and the Japides, uh, the Japids, sorry, on, on their way, integrating parts of them. Uh, the cr parts of the crushed Herli came back to Scandinavia, for instance. Interestingly enough, the Japids were kind of more absorbed. The Japids lived around essentially today's uh, Hungary and um, and and uh, Romania and Western Romania, uh, they um, the Longobards assimilated them and brought them together in, with them into Italy, and, and and the case of the Saxons is just one. But actually, the um, in, when the Longobards migrated into the Italian peninsula, they had with them um, very strong numbers of other populations, including Sarmatians. That probably were also it is true the greatest bulk of um, say foreign elements that they had absorbed over time. Uh, Japids, Bavarians, um, Saxons, as we've seen, but also probably Turks, 
um, Romanized population hmm, of the Pannonian uh, basin. Um, and probably some Slav already at that point. Later on, they absorbed other Turkic populations like the Bur Bulgars, for instance. Um, there was surely at some point this contact with the Avars. People say, well, the mo Longobards moved from the, the Pannonian basin because of the Avars. Um, this is not really true. At least we have no um, historical evidence of what, uh, whether the the um, balance of power at, that, at the point of the Longobard migration was such for which to, to for the Avars to push the Longobards away. Um, also because the Avars at that point had not been the um, were not united in the fashion they would reach um, a few um, decades later. They were still s relatively scattered, and eventually they turned mostly against the Byzantines. The Longobards most likely migrated into Italy because uh, the Romans called them in there. So also the myth that kind of the Longobards invaded Roman Italy and destroyed it's really not true. Today, even we have no proof, we tend to believe the Longobards were called by the Byzantines, which would explain a big lot of freaking lot of things, including the fact that the Byzantines had left unguarded Italy and they probably thought they could settle these guys into the Palm Valley to form this kind of sort of buffer state against the Franks. They also were looking at Italy at that point in this vacuum uh, because the empire had no, uh, you know, especially after the plague, had not enough uh, manpower resources to keep uh, the area. In fact, most of northern Italy at that point was uh, garrisoned uh, by mm, Gothic um, troops that had been essentially defeated, but in this sense left where they were by the Byzantines after the end of the Gothic War. The Longobards had participated together with the Byzantines also to the Gothic War, not really, you know, fighting as a people, the Goths in Italy, but by essentially sending um, some thousand, uh, um, I think, I the sources of, say, say something like uh, 2,500 warriors pl plus um, 3,000 retainers. Um, into Italy, and in fact, they f the Longobards fought for the Byzantines in uh, famously at the Battle of Tagine in uh, f uh, 552. Um, they they knew Italy, and that's also part of the reason why they decided to migrate in there. Uh, th there are many anecdotes. Maybe uh, we will see this all in detail. So today. I will try to stick to, to the military stuff now. Um, but this is important because there were a group also of Burgundians, of Swabians among the Longbirds. They all came and settled in Italy. And, and, and this, um, um, this is, I'm stressing this because it's very important to understand how the Longbirds in all this, however, still consider themselves as a unique people. I mean, these elements I just mentioned now were uh, certain ethical components that joined the Longbirds during the migration in Italy, because this was this was normal during the migration era. If someone was going to conquer a new land, it was well enough, everybody would join from everywhere. Um, but the point is that Longobards had, were also pretty consistent as a people on their own, um, and as we've seen. And, and these numbers uh, were basically collected along the way, uh, along this long journey through, through Europe. And if what is interesting about Longobards in this sense is that this very strong military atlas, cohesion and identity um, had made basically everybody who joined um, them to become a Longobard. And this is something that it happened w uh, before and after the settlement in Italy. The Longobards integrated quite qu quickly the Roman subjects. This is also a very um, grossly misunderstood idea. I mean, the fact that the Italic population was some kind of enslaved and always kept like slave. Absolutely false. There was no convenience, say, also for the Longobards to, to do ever such a thing. On the contrary, and the only reason why we get so few about, we know so few about the Roman population that was such in virtue of a juridical identity more than else, is that simply most of this population had passed, had crossed to the Longobard side. Sometimes even literally, because the, um, the population that inhabited, for instance, the areas of Byzantine Italy were, was so vexed by the, uh, the uh, taxation the Byzantines were imposing on them that they, we know it from the letters of bishops to Constantinople, from Italy to Constantinople, that these populations were crossing um, um, and going to live into the Longobard lands. So not really what a slave would do. Um, and um, we we have we will see this, um, and this has always been very important for the Longobards because they managed basically to get their strength and their numbers from these people. And at the time of the migration into Italy, this had produced, um, together with you know, a lot of warfare. You know, they, they kept the Longobards kept up in shape in the, in the during the migration era as strong fighters and. 
in this, in the, the key for this success was an equilibrated society. We know from the tombs we find, especially in Pannonia, in this area where, you know, just before the migration into Italy, that there was, a, compared to other populations, such as the Japanese, for instance, the Longbirds had a very strong middle class. That is, the, they, they obviously had their elite, their oligarchies, but these were relatively weak compared to the bulk of the freemen. Um, and, and this means that it was a society that was well kept in shape according to the Germanic um, balance, uh, the, the idea of the um, uh, freemen's um, uh, freedom, in fact. Um, and th the... Uh, that, that was quite functional for also for the cohesion of the army. Population like Japits for, were very different, for instance, because the, the Japits in that case, for instance, had a much more uh, stratified society with very rich but few mm, oligarchs at the top and an impoverished population so that when the Longobards fought against the Japits, they managed to crush them uh, because they were much more cohesive as a group, as a political and social group, and this was reflected also in the military. Um, the um, <coughs> the Longobards had this great characteristic, military speaking, also of looking more like a population of the steppe than a Germanic population. This concept of, has been very much stressed, um, especially uh, also in ethical terms. In my opinion, this is not true, um, or at least we have no evidence for it. Um, we we don't know what of those um, one hundred thousand that migrated into the Pont Valley uh, were actually of Germanic origin or or more of Sar a Sarmatian origin, for instance, we don't know. I personally believe, for also from many hints, that these were substantially German. Um, and that, however, we, we shouldn't be tricked in this sense by the, the adaptability of certain people to, the, um, to certain um, practices. Um, the mistake, according to me, derives from the fact that if you look at the tombs that, um, uh, of the longer birds into Pannonia and, and eventually into the first um, stage of Italian uh, history when they were still not entirely Christianized so they still buried their warriors in arms. Unfortunately from the half of the 7th century they got completely Christianized so they stopped doing this. Um, the, um, and we don't have any uh, element uh, at that point uh, from our uh, you know, in terms of equipment especially in archaeology. Um, but we see that um, they, the Longobards obviously had a facies that was um, completely very similar to the one of the steps. I mean, the uh, Longobard equipment, uh, this uh, kind of mm, mm, lamellar armor that is typical from the steps, from the Pannonian plains to the um, to to uh, the Bering Strait, we can say, um, was perfectly known by the Longobards. The Longobards uh, were great. Um, um, Horsemen, uh, they were often buried with their horses. We find um, uh, bows and arrows together with them. So these guys were essentially very, very influenced by the steppe military. And one of the reasons um, for this, since they actually never went in the steppes, they, they were uh, only the gods and someone else uh, went at far east in the Ukraine in the steppes where the, uh, the um, disarmations lead and, and they got so very strongly, strong in cavalry and so on especially the Ostrogoths. The Longobards didn't, but seemingly were someone among, or perhaps even the most, because this is also underestimated, um, horse uh, riding population of the um, among the Germanic peoples. Okay, I give you the Ostrogoths probably were more than the Longobards, but also about the Ostrogoths we have relatively less, and we shouldn't perhaps excessively stress that they were, these were kind of steps peoples in as such. In my opinion, um, um, what we see is, you know, the, the concept is we have this modernistic prejudice for which if a people fights in the fashion of someone else, it is because this population has mixed, has necessarily mixed with those others. This is true, because this is what happened in practice, but you can't underestimate also the adaptability capabilities of a population. Um, so I'm not saying that these po the Longobards were not mixed with the Sarmatians, because they were, actually, and, and that's also contributed so much to give them this kind of um, steps outlook. But they objectively remained, so they, they got all, especially all these refugees from the, um, from the uh, Eurasian steps that were fleeing from the uh, Hunnic uh, invasions. Mm -hmm. So these, all these populations were mostly Iranian in origin, so they were Sarmatians, etc. They 
flooded Germany at a certain point. And Longobard saw this as a good opportunity to, to integrate these elements now that we're essentially crushed and desperate and, and not really working as a unique population but coming in groups, as it was normal actually also be among the Longobards, as we will see. And they absorbed them. But what I find most interesting, and that is also overlooked and not er very much said, is that Longobards eventually stayed, like practically all the Germans that remained in Germany and um, in Eastern Europe under the Hunnic domination. Mm. And this was very important because the Germans found themselves among two options: either going sticking with the Romans and others are going with the uh, sticking with the Huns. Um, and I, I made some videos. Um, I explained this. Um, for instance, I made a video on the Burgundians. That is kind of interesting in that case because the Burgundians are interesting because they kind of were wavering between the two sides at a certain point. Longobard stuck definitely with the Huns and seemingly and we don't know actually much about Longobards before they eventually arrived into Pannonia so after the uh, essentially at the end of the 5th century when the Hunnic Empire was had vanished um, and they had been free to, to move once again by the way. Um, but we suggest also, also from certain um, I don't know how to say that um, um, from certain uh, descendants suffix in the um, name of certain Longobard kings of the period that allegedly was in fact during the fifth century, the first half of the fifth century under Attila's empire, is that the Longobards were enormously influenced by the, the Huns. They probably were living also very close to the, the major center um, of Hunnic power. And this would explain a, f a freaking lot of things, including all the zootechnical knowledge the Longobards had, this great passion for cavalry, and this outlook that really was pretty much the one of the steps. So the, the, the this idea that Longobards, um, you know, were had to be necessarily mixed to have acquired that um, war military culture is not. It doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, the the Germans, especially at this time, were extremely receptive. Uh, they were capable of s absorbing um, uh, f um, external influences very very much, and it's likely that also that minimal uh, cohesion that the Longobards had and that um, you know made them grow as uh, a larger population than just the tiny bulk that existed in Germany at the time was also due to the control that the uh, that the Huns made on these uh, people as well as uh, other Germans, because it was much easier to, um, say, to control a single king than this, all these many different clans that basically acted on their own. And the Longobards actually were so egalitarian in nature, and they, they, they object, uh, they, um, when they, they got rid of the Huns, basically they aborted, they rejected the monarchy. And we have a great evidence of this also in many uh, you know, in their tradition, what we know about their tradition of the origins, that is uh, particularly reliable also um, compared to other mm, myths of the origins of other Germanic populations that are completely invented um, and uh, also fabricated in part together with the Roman historiography uh, after they settled into the ex-Roman Empire. Actually, they, the, the Longobards had this extremely reliable um, tradition that shows us how at a certain point the kings tried to to, to, you know, to to rule over over the population, but this population refused it. And the Longobard uh, myth of the origins is a myth of the people that even includes the women in, into the um, into the account. Women were ver women were were extremely important in the Longobard culture and 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 history. Um, and um, it it. The, uh, the Longobard people was extremely unruly for this very reason, that they were cohesive as a group, but they they all worked uh, kind of alone, autonomously. Uh, all the clans kind of had their own autonomy. And, and this is why they were, uh, this is what all archaeology sa says, as we've seen, that this mm, population that was largely essentially made up of, of freemen, of the middle class, we would say in that context, and had a very low stratification. And this worked pretty well uh, to fight, mm -hmm. in order to fight. I mean, this cohesion stemmed objectively from the mess that Germany was, that Central Europe was at the time, this continuous warfare, this continuous waves of invaders, this continuous um, bloodsheds and so on. And the Longobards had uh, taken this um, 
the pride of their identity essentially revolving around this military prowess that had to make them go through uh, all this mess. So a cohesion that, however, when they arrived into Italy, couldn't work anymore because Italy was an extremely different uh, environment. Um, that clanic um, nature of the Longobard people that we've seen was, um, I mean, this egalitarian was now used, um, w w had been created in a world that that was essentially semi-nomadic in nature, so that y it couldn't, um, you know, nomadism in this sense is very important because uh, it, it, there is no way you can survive in there if you don't move constantly, and if you move constantly you have to be ready for war at all times. When you get in a land like Italy, that in spite of all the devastations was still pretty fertile and rich and so on, you don't need this anymore because you become sedentary, you can make um, a lot of, you know, you can make a living out of the uh, local um, resources, also ma making uh, the subject populations working for you. So at that point, that uh, extreme sense of pressure that existed before, and that we see also from art that depicts us these extremely violent scenes of uh, men torn apart by terrible you know, snakes that devour them, and so it kind of loosens up. The longer birds actually mixed with the Italic population, Romanized populations, pretty pretty quickly, as far as we can see in a few generations actually, and they um, they uh, the, the main problem was, however, the at that point, that given that it, it, uh, all, every clan now had a viable option on its own, so they didn't have to stick together because now they had seized Italy, and it was it was done. You know, they had made it. Uh, they had made the big uh, thing. Uh, they at the beginning they were extremely unruly, because everybody wanted to see, essentially to seize its own duchy, as they were called it, um, and and you know screw the monarchy, no, we don't care, we don't want to have it. When the Longbirds had been in Pannonia, they um, had been uh, essentially guided by a bit by the Byzantines and at a certain point mm, used them as we have seen also as a sort of uh, auxiliaries, as allies, you know, the, the Longbirds uh, ser um, served um, in in massive numbers into the Byzantine army um, at many times, even during after they settled in Italy, actually half of the Longbirds stuck to the Byzantines and were still there in part. Also, the, the, there were mm, thousands of Longbirds witnessed in, in Armenia in the Byzantine army. Um, we have this kind of thing. Excuse me, drink a little one once again. So, and this suggests actually that the and the people kept not being united for for a long time but the byzantines had however tried to give them to give the longbirds like just a bit like the huns did um to give them a, a um a unity to give them a bit of a more of a political uh, cohesion um by um backing by supporting a chief, and this is how the family of Albevin, that was already prominent into among the Longbirds, came at this point to become, you know, the the leading, um, the leading clan, the leading power. And Albevin is actually remembered, in fact, in many uh, in the Ger into the um, Germanic epics. Even Snorri Sturluson, if I'm not wrong, talks about him. You know, it's this uh, hero of the legions that he defeated the Japits, he invaded Italy. I mean, he was a great Germanic hero in the um, 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 in the epics of this. And just for s telling you, also how the what the Longobards were doing was also observed by other uh, Germanic populations in all of Europe. And so. Albevin led famously um, uh, the Longobard people into Italy, but he was not capable of giving it a, uh, giving them a political unity. Um, the bulk of the Longobards essentially was settled into the Po Valley, and this area, also for mm, certain geographical reasons, environmental reasons, was more easily controllable, and it would become, in fact, the bulk of the. Um, of the uh, Longobard kingdom, and uh, from this area, especially uh, around centers like the western Po Valley, like the area of Milan, for instance, of Pavia, became 
Pinner is essentially the center of, in fact, the same name of today's Lombardy comes from, from the Lombards for that very reason. They had also a very kind of important center to the northeast, the region of um, close to Venice, this area of, uh, you know, between the Trento region, uh, the f um, Friuli, uh, this that remained quite strongly longer. The rest, um, this was really the bulk of the kingdom, and it was, um, although these areas, these two areas were a bit different, they kind of stuck together also for political reasons, contrary wise to what other people think. The Longobard Kingdom was not at all fragmented, and I discussed this um, uh, extensively and in, uh, in also in detail in, in other videos I made about the Longobards. Um, this was the real bulk. Then there were other duchies in the s in the center and the south of Italy that kind of remained a bit more on their own. Uh, the most unruly was the duchy of of of, of Spoleto. Mm -hmm. This actually was closer because it was in central Italy, so it was closer to the north. But perhaps just for for this reason, they they feared more the expansion of the north and the duchy of Benevent. That instead was pretty actually pretty loyal to, to the north. I mean, they, they, what is interesting is what finally the Longobards created a kingdom because they were being assaulted by the Franks and the Byzantines at the same time in the second half of the 6th century. Um, they decided to elect a king and to essentially create this new institution that, as we've seen, was completely new uh, in, in its forms. I mean, um, the Duke, the, all the Longobard Dukes at this point were meant to give one third of their own property they had seized um, into Italy to the king in order to make um, to make him, you know, the state work in a centralized, you know, with with a certain degree of centralization. So, for, especially chiefly for the army, um, as now the Longobard kings were fighting against the Byzantines pretty harshly and so on. Um, and there was a, a no point uh, any. Longobard duchy that said, okay, we don't recognize the Longobard kingdom. The, the Longobards were, uh, in spite of all their kind of, um, now there were cer certain dukes that naturally wanted to be more autonomous and so on, but they never said, okay, I don't recognize the kingdom because we're still Longobards and we're still elected as a people uh, our king. Um, so it's about us. And in fact, the Longobards represent the only case that I can think of of elective monarchy in the uh, Romano-Germanic history uh, that actually worked. The Longobards elected their kings practically all, at all times. They um, and they elected also pretty good kings f for for the greatest part and pretty effective rulers. And, and so this is very very interesting because you don't find it practically anywhere else. You know, the Anglo-Saxon England was a mess of tens of of, of several kingdoms. Um, Merovingian France was uh, unavoidably marked by this idea of splitting the the kingdom among the uh, you know the various uh, sons and every generation this caused practically the Merovingian kingdom not to exist anymore by the end of the 7th century. Visigod Visigothic Spain was practically dominated by this ecclesiastical slash um, formerly senatorial um, uh, elite that uh, basically a right to choke the monarchy that didn't control like mm, 30 miles out of if not 30 miles out of, of, of Toledo. Um, the Longobards instead also thanks to the fact that Italy had been basically raised to the ground uh, during the Gothic War um, they kind of um, managed to export their Germanic models in a much more effective way because um, now the Italic population was much more um, was like them. Th th there was not the senatorial elite there that bothered them. No, they, they essentially these Germanic models were qu quite enticing, quite attractive also for the Italic population that as we have seen got progressively, I don't know, say it, um, Germanized in tradition and in juridical identity, and in fact, the this Longobard identity was extremely strongly and and deeply rooted in in the Italian Middle Ages, and it, it also arguably the whole Italy was called by other populations like the Franks, like the Arabs, it was called as Longobardy. 
point, even into areas that had not been controlled by the Longobards. So it's quite interesting. Also, the Italians were during low Middle Ages was known were known generally as the Lombards, even though in that case it's also because most of the merchants came from Lombardy as well. But it wasn't such. Even there were many Tuscans as well. But this idea that the that Italy maintained this more um, another point the Longobards never did is to recollect the Roman legacy. Other populations kind of all said, okay, now we start calling, even the Anglo-Saxons started calling, started calling themselves things like imperators. Um, even Basileus at a certain point. Uh, the Longobards never, ever did. The Longobards were Germans and remained Germans and they never cared we are, they, they be became at a certain point protectors of the Romans, especially when they seized the lands of the Exarchate, so that there were these all these populations had remained Byzantine, so in Roman in, um, especially also in juridical practice and so on, because otherwise it wasn't a great difference between the two the areas in the Apennine Peninsula. But so that uh, I still, for that point, the Longobard king said, "Okay, I, f I, I, I am king of the Longobards and king of you know of this Romanized population. I protect essentially." But it was a transitory situation, then. Mm, it, it it wasn't evolving towards a Romanization of the Longobard identity at all. And this sticking to the Germanic model was actually very much appreciated by all the Germanic peoples, and even the Franks that had done everything to recollect the Roman legacy to become the emperors of the West, ideally it's always remaining German, of course, but you know, also acquiring this very strong relation with uh, the concept of empire in also in Romanized form, the Longobards said no. They remained Lombards with, with their kingdom, point, nothing else. And this was a greatly admired, because they were the ones who stuck to that tradition and never, uh, and all the other Germans kind of admired this idea. In fact, the Longobards, um, generally speaking, fit also into this group of the Germans that stuck always kind of um, against the Romans, ideally. You know, that uh, the, um, especially the Visigoths, the Franks, the Burgundians, the, the, the word that the chunk the state with Rome. They had the word the ancient federati, Roman allies, and so on. Populations like the um, the Longobards, uh, and the Longobards especially, uh, because also the Alamanni and the Ostrogoths that kind of sided a, a little bit with um, with the anti-Roman party, let's say, the, the also a bit with the Huns and so on. They, however, got a bit. Ro they became eventually Roman allies. The Longobards never. So they 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 were kind of this completely extraneous, extremely superficially Romanized population from Central Europe. At a certain point, arrived to rule in the very center of what the Romans had started their empire from. They never took Rome, uh, even though they were about to do it um, a couple of times, and they would have seized it substantially, not really in an anti papal function, because they also the myth that the Longobards were these terrible Aryans uh, that uh, despised uh, the Roman Catholics, absolutely false. The, Ro the Longobards were fully uh, Catholic by the second half of the 7th century. They were actually pretty good Catholic. They also sided with the papacy against um, uh, the Byzantine Empire when the, the Byzantines were going nuts by trying to support uh, certain, um, well, for pragmatic reasons, things like, you know, um, heterodoxy to, to preserve the Eastern regions or also during the iconoclasm. Um, and actually, the Longobards had mostly friend relations with the, the papacy. Um, yeah, there were this kind of looming threat over the uh, Roman duchy and so on, but eventually even uh, before the long the, the Carolingian conquest um, the the Longobards w would have not wiped out the papacy as such on the contrary they would have probably done what the Carolingians did that is they do would probably try to to absorb it and to guide it and to use it for their own for the aggrandizement of their own monarchy um, this history is important because in the meanwhile basically um, it is I'm very Im Im you know I now, I want to repeat myself because I already told these things in, in the other videos, but the um, I'll stress how much the Longobard Kingdom was much more unitary than it's thought. There was this um, um, historiographical, very old historiographical current that fortunately in Academy today is, is being completely debunked, according to which the the Longobards were all split into different duchies, there was no central authority, were all divided. This is completely false. Completely false. Um, the 
the, the big block of the Longobard Kingdom was the Po Valley and at a certain point Tuscany and Liguria that were uh, annexed by and these were really the this was really the kingdom in in practice in theory the kingdom stretched up to up to Sicily in theory be also because the southern Longobards kind of expanded further south also clashing against the Byzantines especially that your benefit was something territorially quite extended I made a video about the southern Longobards um, that can be interesting for you um, but even these other um, southern um, Duchies were known as the Langobardia Minor into central and southern Italy were actually recognizing the the Longobard king. As a matter of fact, when uh, Benevento and Duke at a certain point became uh, even Longobard king in the north, and uh, he was elected as such, uh, the more really the more rebellious were the, the ones in the center, the ones of Spoleto, because they did, those did everything not to be you know the kind of always rebelled, but even these rebellions were never threatening the unity of the Longobard monarchy. Never, ever. Not even politically or military, because it was just a, ju a, a duchy, you know, in the upper nines. And, you know, they couldn't compete with the the, uh, the king of, in the Po Valley. There was no resource to, to do that. And it just took the king to make, actually, most of the times, bloodless marches into these territories to take out the rebel duke, putting on some someone else and going away and at least until that duke lived everything was fine and it was literally all like that all the also the alleged difference between um the so-called neustria and austria there were these uh, a bit like in in the francia there were these two areas that we've seen it was respectively the Western Po Valley and Eastern Po Valley is myth, is a myth, uh, especially from a political and military, from a strategical point of view. Um, uh, these two areas of the Po Valley had the same interests, that is, defending the Po Valley. Hmm? Austria, the eastern part, was the most militarized, also the one that maintained probably the strongest Longobard identity, and they were on the border with the Avars and the Slavs, and there was a lot of warfare going on in there. Um, at least for early medieval standards, where these continuous clashes, the Longobards also suffered certain defeats, but maintained the control over, um, over, over those areas. And this myth of the division is essentially... Um, given by uh, certain authors that looked only at the very end of Longobard history, when practically there was the last king, Desiderius, that was, he had himself being elected essentially with the approval of the papacy and of the Franks. Now this compl came com completely in a in a completely um, devastating situation in which the Longobard kingdom had already been invaded um, twice by Pippin the Short, so the world situation was um, the world kingdom was in turmoil because now the f it was un being understood that the Franks were about to to take it sooner or later. Um, at this point, Desiderius was elected, in fact, just because that, um, Charlemagne had still his um, uh, step brother, I think, alive, um, and uh, therefore he needed an ally in Italy. But you know, when eventually uh, Charlemagne uh, Charlemagne's brother died. Charlemagne united the whole Frankish kingdom and was called finally into Italy to this time to to seize the whole kingdom that he maintained institutionally speaking taking for himself the Longobard crown so not wiping it out because um, the Franks in spite of what it said uh, hugely admired the, 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 the Longobards were actually the only Germanic population that they considered um, as peers and uh, this is very interesting by the way uh, there was a lot of some marriage ties with the Longobards, a lot of um, uh, this kind of Germanic adoption between kings. You know, this was the ritual that Liutbrand, for instance, if I'm not wrong, was sent to the Frankish court to have his hair cut like a man during uh, when he reached adulthood. These are these rituals that were, you know, that witnessed many, also many contacts between these populations and. Um, great interactions, the, the Longobards fought also, uh, they were called by the Franks um, uh, 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 um, to, uh, by, by Charles Martel. Hmm? Charles Martel asked Lutebrand to come with his army into southern France to fight the, the Arabs together with them, and Lutebrand even went, seemingly, at least um, we're not sure, but so there was this unity that is often overlooked also in these international relations. Now, 
to make the long story short, however, the uh, the Franks that were kind of the biggest thing now was in terms of a military machine and were much huge than the Longbirds. You know, the Longbird Kingdom in comparison to the whole Carolingian Empire was just a tiny thing. It was just a Paw Valley. It was big as much as one of the um, uh, Thailand Reich the, uh, of the of the uh, of the Carolingian Empire. So, why were the Longbirds defeated? It's it's not that they had much of a of a of a choice, and plus now that the Franks were devil developing the the strongest military in in Europe uh, on a professional base that basically didn't exist in any other Romano-Germanic kingdom, so it's not much of a mystery why the Longbirds were were destroyed by the Franks, um, and um, th to make the long story short, you know, there was a kind of revival of um, Longbird rule in, in the south of Italy between the 9th and the 10th century before they were eventually defeated by the Byzantines at the Battle of Cannae. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the same place of the Battle of the, the Second Punic War uh, in 1018. Um, and, and this battle was extremely important because it basically wiped out much of those resources that ultimately would have been able to stem the Norman um, invasion of uh, of those lands. Or better, you know, actually the Normans were already fighting with as mercenaries for the southern uh, Longbirds at this point. Um, but in fact, in the same Battle of Cannae, they were defeated um, um, by the Byzantines at that point. They were slaughtered to to the last, you know, the lo of the Normans who fought at Cannae, um, uh, there were 20 uh, to 250, only 10 survived, so it's kind of interesting already. Um, but, you know, these connections were also with these northern populations that were revived. Mm -hmm. Actually, Normandy and, and southern Italy at this point were very close in in um also in cultural relations it was the um Mont Saint Michel that was uh, twinned with uh, the um uh, the Saint Michael uh, archangel of uh, the Gargano that were you know also in here also in Norm during Norman times it still maintained also pretty much of a of a contact so it's um the Longobards kind of never were cut out from this um, kind of Germanic world in its an entirety in the European world and, and they they preserved very strongly this, norm, uh, this uh, Germanic identity. In fact, also many including Paul the Diakon, the greatest uh, historian of, um, one of the greatest um, uh, historians of early medieval times um, fled into uh, when the Longobard kingdom was destroyed he fled into the south it was that there were many uh, refugees from the north that that fled into uh, Benevent and, and so on by the way Paul the Diacon eventually would you know be kind of um, adopted by the Carolingians themselves and he had been by the way the, the brother of one of the uh, Longobard dukes that rebelled to the Carolingians uh, at a certain point and even won seemingly their autonomy there is this battle of the Limenza River that nobody actually knows what what happened in there. Um, in um, uh, there is a source who says the Franks won, and our sources says the Longobards won. And and all we know is, however, that Charlemagne at that point gave to the northeastern um, Longobard dukes a much greater freedom. So we suggest the 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 Longobards of the northeast might have even defeated the Carolingian army at that point. It is not a few, actually, and, and, and they... <coughs> so there, there is all these very fascinating details that I might tell you when I will go... If you're interested in, into the uh, Longbird history, about Longbird history in uh, from my thesis, it's a bit long, but, you know, I will do it by chunks, of course. Um, so... And, and eventually, you know, the, the Longobards, um, I discussed that there is no need for, for me now to repeat it in, in the video on the Longobard, the Aminor. They, they were essentially conquered by the Normans at the very end. Mm -hmm. uh, also because this Southern Italy had, so Longobard Southern Italy had um, kind of beginning to, to split up in several principalities. So this is a bit of the background situation. Now let's give a look to the military organization proper. So, as in every um, Germanic uh, society, every freeman was obliged to perform a military a military service. Mm -hmm. um, the um, Longbird um, this system had worked 
uh, all the time, all times in, in Longobard history, even when, uh, you know, from Germany to when also where they were fully centralized and mixed with the um, Italian populations. Um, so mm, this was the norm, actually, also in other mm, Romano-Germanic kingdoms, uh, also in here of mm, uh, in any place, um, the uh, the the Longobards the Longobards had a, a language on their own, by the way, that uh, was pretty akin to today's Southern German. Um, they were in fact quite close in. They were Elb Germans, uh, so which may uh, sometimes you find them qualified as Eastern Germans, but it's not quite a. Of course, not, it's a matter of you know an arbitrary way, but. You know, Eastern Germans are more like the uh, the Goths, the the Vandals, the Burgundians. Um, the the Longobards were kind of more of the uh, more akin to the to the Saxons. Um, well, okay, linguistically to to the Alamanni and the Bavarians actually. Um, so they they came all from there. The Saxons actually came from came from the north. Uh, I mean, okay, they had mixed up a little bit there because the the Longobards had remained on the Elbe when the Saxons were advancing, so they, they came in contact, but that's what, you know, today's Southern German and Austrian, kind of the the most similar um, languages to what Longobard uh, was, and we know uh, something from the uh, Longobard vocabulary as well, thanks to the loaves that the Longobards wrote down. Um, however, the, um, the Longobard, there were also a lot of Latin transliteration. Um, the Freeman call was known as sometimes as exercitalis, which is a fully Latin term at this point, so literally the guy w goes into the army. Hmm. And the or, or, which it was an equivalent actually, the arimannus, which is the Latinization obviously of Hermann, hmm. so the man of the army, literally. Um, and this qualified the freeman. Hmm? The, uh, if you were an Arimannus, you were a not only a someone eligible for for war, but you were eligible for war because you were the Germanic freeman of the Longobard people. Hmm? Um, also, in here, who were actually all these populations? Before we stressed um, that the Longobards were. They had a, a gr an enormous ability of integration, mm -hmm. and this had meant their survival in, during the migration era, because they always strengthened the, the consistency of their manpower through this way. And there are many. Um, there is this myth that I already said before that at a certain point the the Longobards were as if they, they had been the elite. This freeman had been the elite on. Um, a majority of of kind of enslaved population, especially when they migrated into Italy, but this is practically false. It's false at so many levels because the the problem is we don't have much of the sources here, but it's a matter of um, you know dynamics, demic dynamics. The Longobards migrated into Italy with, let's say, roughly one hundred thousand men was a huge amount of po uh, population, but not much for making a huge impact in on the Italian population, and at this time was counted in into millions still, and so the Longobards ranged uh, from, let's say, 1 to maximum 3% of the whole Italian population. It is true that there were certain areas of the Italian peninsula that were um, especially after the war had been, uh, the Gothic War had been depopulated um, so that in certain places the Longobards had a, a greater ethnical impact, uh, especially into the, the p certain areas of the Po Valley, but also around uh, Spoleto and Benevent. Uh, seemingly also today there is kind of a greater number of mm, blonde-haired, blue-eyed mm, people around those areas than, than in ours, so th there is this kind of mark. Especially, this is very interesting in the Apennine, uh, because uh, that's where kind of the population remained less altered. It is true that the 
obviously th there had been also the gods that had settled in there previously in in, in 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 actually in similar positions because also the gods controlled mostly from from northern Italy and they scattered along the Apennine and there were many gods actually also the Ugotic war that had remained into Italy and that joined the Longobards also especially the garrisons that um were holding into northern Italy that were ridiculous in terms of manpower. They, they simply opened the gates to the Longobards and joined, and these gods became evidently Longobards on, the, on their own. They were adopted, and you know, juridically they, they were now um, they became now Longobards on their own. But it, it's really a ludicrous to believe that at this point, having entered into a place like Italy that was still, you know, pretty good in infrastructural terms, in terms of resources and so on, and that all the population was essentially still very consistent and uh, also Romanized, so they also had this, um, you know, abilities that were very useful for government, for administration and so on, in spite of the uh, eradication of the senatorial elite had been wiped out by the Gothic War, that the Longobards could, you know, do without this population and keeping, you know, these guys enslaved and humiliated, uh, you know, just to risk a, a revolt every once in a while. They didn't have the manpower to do that, nor the reason. So, m there were certain scholars in the past now, in a very remote past, um, say in the 19th century, and I think maybe the, begin the very beginning of the 20th century, wanted to stress the Germanism of the Longobards as if these had conquered um, the Italian populations had kept them enslaved, and the, pr the alleged proof that obviously was wrong, uh, because it was in, it would have been indirect at least, is that practically in during Longobard times, it, um, in spite of the good documentation we have uh, for European standards in, in into Italy, there was a very small mention of the Roman population. By this point, and this is the, the really the, the interesting thing, is that why, when we me say German, in this case Longobard or Roman, we're not actually dis discussing the ethnicity of these populations. Um, I'll leave aside that, you know, even the various populations were quite mixed, because as we've seen, the Longobards were mixed with other populations. Also, Italy was this mix between Gauls and I Italics, so it's not... The um, um, the point was at at that point belonging to a certain juridical group. Hmm? Juridical groups w were what made the ethnicity at the time. It's like with the Longobards. All these one hundred thousand population of people, of course, they did not descend from the guys who came from Scandinavia in one hundred um, in one hundred BC. There were other tribes. In, of Germany, there were these Sarmatians, these Turks, these Romanized populations, that is, Romans that basically lived into Pannonia and that now joined the Longobards and, and re entered into Italy. So it's kind of, you know, we can't imagine how mixed this thing was. Um, then um, the Longobards, at certain point during the 7th century, they even settled certain Bulgarians from the Balkans into uh, central Italy, as a matter of fact. They, they gave them certain depopulated land to stay there, and there were beautiful burials in there. So, by the way, also an injection of other steps, elements into this um, already kind of horse riding mentality of, of the Longobards. Um, but the, the point is exactly here, that the lack of Romans in the sources that are contemplated by the Germanic law, the Longobard law, because it, the um, Rotary Code, that is also very probably most important collection of Germanic laws in, in the history, um, in early medieval times, is... Um, is referring to the Roman. I mean, there was the option, of course, the Longobards were saying, you know, the Romans have to do this, and I mean, there was a sort of disciplining also there. Uh, not, it's not that they disciplined their law, because the Longobards ne never had a say in what the Roman law had to be like. Unlike the Goths or the um, the Burgundians, that made kind of a mix of the two, uh, German, Germanic and Roman laws. Um, but, you know, it, the, the code still disciplined what the Romans had to be. And also in the documents, um, however, they remain in, in, in kind of at the margin of the edict. Um, and also in the documents, there is a very few mention of these Romans. So 
many historians said, okay, this is the reason because these Romans were so marginalized in Longobard society that they didn't ap even appear. Today, how we interpret it, it's obviously that it's not that the Romans were marginalized, but basically nobody in the Longobard lands was almost a Roman anymore. It is that the majority of the population had been compl completely Germanized at this point in juridical tradition, and everybody was kind of being um, uh, absorbed into this uh, ethnic group. How was it done? Well, we, we don't have a clear idea. Also because the edict was written in the um, essentially in the first half of the 7th century, so essentially during the the second or even third uh, generation that the Longobards had been there and this situation is already shaped up and you realize also by how the edict is written that uh, albeit remaining a Germanic law it's massively influenced by Ro Roman political and administrative practice if anything because it's written in Latin among other things so obviously someone had to teach the Longobards how to write in Latin and, and, and the fact that they wrote in Latin for a Germanic people tells it all mm -hmm. so that these populations were and we see it also from archaeology that you know the Longobards were mixing okay like it's the first of two generations lived separately from the Romans the others were completely now living in indistinguishable um, so the point is that the uh, also in, in previous history we have I think f also from the legions of, uh, of the people that uh, it was common practice since a very early age to free slaves in the Longobard uh, society especially this was uh, uh, was done in I think since the very beginning of Longobard history in the myth of the origin there is this idea that to increase manpower um, there was this ritual for which these slaves were touched with the point of an arrow and they became free men and were integrated into the Longbird group. And this was the, say, the poetic um, metaphor that the, the had been, in this sense, absorbed and handed down to the, the, the Longbird tradition to tell how the Longbirds basically increased their numbers, they enlarged the population by integrating all these slaves. Because technically, when the Germans migrated into Italy, you know, the vanquished was slave, was not a freeman. Hmm? And there were, at all times, in Longobard history, these kind of serfs that were called as such. But you understand that by the time of the Carolingian conquest, and also after the Carolingian conquest, there was nothing like that anymore. I mean, the Longobards now were also at all levels of society, from Carolingian law. So you realize that this... Um, juridical identity had been extended to everyone and um, and this was a huge advantage because first of all it was an advantage for everybody because the Longobards in this way got more men for the army and they were the same people who were living in Italy now already in their homes in their lands and, and so on it, it, it the Longobards did cease and it was as it was normal and pretty standard also for the same Romans to give when they accepted the Federati in their own land Usually was it was the hospitality. It was one, usually one third of the land. Hmm? That surely the Longobards seized because also when they invaded Italy, they basically every duke took what what they found. It was the only true turbulent times because um, uh, the Longobards actually there is no archaeological evidence of massive destructions at the time of the Longobards, chiefly because Italy had already been destroyed. Secondly, because um, it's very stupid to destroy a place where you're going to live in. So actually the major s destructions were carried out into those uh, lands um, the Longobards were fighting against. I mean, the greatest destructions at this time were not happening within, obviously, the place where the Longobards had settled, but at the borders with the Byzantines. And when you study, uh, you know, how the, you know, the Longobards and the Byzantines fought, you know, this scorched end strategy was carried out by both sides, and this was pretty normal, actually. Um, so it's true that many places went destroyed, but not so many to, to make Italy crumble at all uh, at that point. Uh, in the long as if the Longobards had arrived and had raised everything to the ground. This never happened. There is no historical evidence whatsoever of this. The only problem was this political frag fragmentation that bra basically brought the Longobards to scatter all over the peninsula in autonomous but not independent groups. And these um, 
uh, fare, as it were called, um, that the um, that basically had no unity. So if pa it's paradox and, and it's paradoxical because if the Longbirds had been a unique, you know, had had a unique uh, aim, they had had a unique guide with their sheer numbers, they might have wiped out the Byzantines immediately from Italy. Immediately and seized the whole peninsula. I said because of this fragmentation, initial fragmentation, they it took them a lot. Hmm? It wasn't something so dramatic as well because what you see objectively in Italy, the the Longobards keep kept all the interland, and the Byzantines kept just some land stripes, mostly coastal centers. And the Longobards never been kind of a maritime power. They were content of taking the and and if you look at Longobard. You know, of Italy at that time, it was essentially a Longobard Italy, and in fact, also the Byzantine um, uh, lands at this point uh, were quite decentralized from Constantinople, of course, and they were essentially Italic in in nature. So it's not that the Byzantines had at this point a huge, you know. Um, the Byzantines, basically, from the end of sixth centuries, they, they were defeated by the Longobards in this in their attempt to to wipe them out in conjunction with the Franks. Then the Arab invasions came uh, from one the Byzantine side. The from the western side, the Frankish monarchy collapsed or at least fragmented uh, irreparably. So basically, the Longobards at that point uh, had the upper hand. They were always on the offensive and was practically no effort to take them out. Just um, under the expedition, I think it was Constance II, if I'm not wrong, the, he led this army into southern Italy, to also put um, Beneventum, uh, Benevent under siege, and then reached Rome, then went back to Sicily to fight the, uh, the Arab piracy and so on. But, you know, there was no further attempt for the Byzantines to wipe out the Longobards. It was the Longobards who, tiny bit by tiny bit, ate up a lot of mm, regions of the Byzantines and were before the Carolingian conquests were essentially about to mm, unify the whole uh, Apennine Peninsula and to, to seize it for, for their own. Um, so, um, but it took them, in fact, w how many years? Essentially, almost, yeah, 200 years to, to achieve that. And uh, they could have um, made it if they had been, you know, more cohesive since the beginning, done it in, in many ways. And, and in part, you can also understand because um, also besieging uh, uh, this Italy had, especially on, on in, in the south where the Byzantine presence was greater, this coastal wall, walled, fortified um, cities, you know, that were also difficult to to put under siege in early medieval times. At this point, but we're, we're talking about extremely poor times. Um, you know, a, a siege of such a city would have. Uh, basically absorbed um, resources of, of the whole Longobard kingdom for for a long time and it was not um, was not easy to do and it was after all not much of a reason it was it was kind of more convenient strategically to consolidate also the administrative practice the political stability and that's what the Longobards achieved by the way because the Longobards Differently from other Romano Germanic populations, managed to strengthen their power over time, whereas other populations kind of began to crumble at a certain point. And all this thanks to the fact that there was no internal aristocracy that could compete practically with the royal power. Differently from what happened in Gaul, different from what happened in Spain. Um, in Italy, the uh, the uh, everything had been flattened. And also there was this greater wealth per capita of the freemen that was not known in, that in our place in the world, um, for which everybody was kind of well off. They had enough resources to live, but they didn't have enough resources to become noblemen who could usurp power. Mm. And in fact, the, the major aristocracies in the Longobard kingdom were de facto urban aristocracies. I mean, even the Longobard duchies that were the um, administrative repartition of the kingdom eventually on the base of those uh, duchies that had formed autonomously by the clans invading Italy were revolving around the city, around the dioceses, and this would remain essentially the the 
the elementary district throughout all Italian history uh, that you know you, the Longobards were essentially living on because they that was it you know the Romans had built those cities in that way because they were in good in favorable positions they were along the roads along the rivers so they were fortified cities so it was obvious that the Longobards were there and this was very important because compared to other populations like I don't know the Anglo-Saxons or the Franks etc where d d um, that lived in a much less urbanized world uh, the Longobards kind of got immediately much more educated I mean the Longobard dukes were extremely they were literate they uh, attended uh, tribunals, they, they judged, they had, uh, the Longobards had a very uh, intense um, written practice and so on, differently from other populations. Politically speaking, um, the, the, the Longobards were far much, um, administratively speaking, were far much ahead, um, far more ahead than the, the, the Franks. This is a, a microscopical evidence. I mean, the, the Franks did one thing very well, that is war. <laughs> the Longobards, as many other Romano Germanic kingdoms now, didn't make much of a good war since th they lacked a professional, a consistent professional army. So, however, their administration was extremely solid, and that's also why the Franks drew heavily from it eventually. So, talking about also the segmentation of um, Longobard society as we've seen there, there were the free, the half free and the slaves but overall these differences were kind of being loosened up. Mm -hmm. This would be the first real, uh, I mean the initial repartition. Mm -hmm. the, the idea was the freeman was the Germanic freeman, the half free man was essentially the maybe the serf that the long word freeman had from you know wherever they had come from this slave was now the the vanquished um romanized population but this difference basically ended mm -hmm. also because everybody in italy had found now more or less a a spot to live and the the living conditions were not different from the one of the rest of the population, as they were, the Longobards were so few also compared to, to the rest, uh, as, as we have seen. Um, there was this always this idea that, in theory, all the also the slaves could be um, mobilized for uh, in, in times of, of, of emergency. It was definitely normal also in before Italy to use, and especially I think before Italy, to use. Um, this serves as um, as fighters as well. They usually fought with you know bows and arrows that were quite prominent, as we've seen also in this um, Central European Germanic populations, also because of the context with the Eastern world and so on. The Eastern um, you know, where there was a lot of horse archery involved, and archers were kind of a need in here. Um, So theoretically, the distinction between the the juridical distinction between the Germans and the Romans remained, but in practice, that this didn't mean anything in the Longobard lands because everybody had become a German, juridically speaking, and they had to serve the army, according also to obviously to the wealth. Um, and this um, process is beautifully. Um, Expressed by the um, rule, um, the um, recruitment laws of Heistulf. Now, Heistulf one was one of the uh, greatest um, uh, kings in Longobard history. Was a great uh, military commander, especially. Uh, we will maybe talk about him in detail in in other on another occasion. He he was the one who also conquered practically these large areas of Byzantine Italy that had remained uh, at that point um, there and that Longobards now came to seize, not even without fighting practically, because seemingly they simply took it without much of an effort. Um, and so these areas were relatively well off because there were lots of traders and so what I still sent 
especially in early medieval times where there are a few demographic resources and so on it was to basically oblige also the Romans to um, in to enter the army how um, well essentially creating a um, Class of record, uh, classes of recruitment that was perfectly an analogous um, uh, to the um, to the Longbird ones. Mm -hmm. So the section was essentially this: if you um, there were three categories practically, one holding, um, you know, starting from from you know, if you had seven months of land, you had to serve on horseback with a shield, a corslet, and a lance. Mm -hmm. A man holding instead forty ujera, uh, between sorry forty ujera and uh, seven months, eh, had to serve on horse, mm -hmm. but only with a lance and shield, so it was would be lighter cavalry. The third category, with less than forty ujera, had to be kept simply with shield, bow and arrows, and made up the infantry. Um, so naturally, um, what is interesting about these laws is um, they were. First of all, you see what the composition of the army is, but this was since um, it obviously it it has sense also in in terms of tactical segmentation to realizing how many people could have such an amount of land. So in this case, cavalry was just an elite, as it would be normal in early medieval Europe. Um, and you have this heavy cavalry, this light cavalry, and then infantry, and presumably there were also other troops like attendants, uh, this lighter also um, uh, yeah, retainers and so on. But what is interesting is that the Heistolf, ex and this was actually, this is the first evidence of the Longobard, let's say, classes of recruitment that show definitely now the full sedentarization of the people because the wealth is measured on the base of the how much land they owned but interestingly enough when this law is written down in the uh, edict by Heistulf this was extended also to the Roman merchants mm -hmm. so people who have enough money so the equivalent also of this l land that had to serve in the army in the same exact way so this tells us very uh, important things. First of all, the idea that the Romans now that have to be understood not in the sense as the Romans who had lived into the Longobard Kingdom practically didn't exist anymore. They had no virtually no even endemic consistency as these were instead the populations were Roman in Roman tradition in the newly conquered Byzantine lands, mm -hmm. and these were not treated as slaves. They were treated as people who had to join the army, just like all the others. This is the great transformation. So all this dark, gloomy idea that I don't know, Longobards were these terrible Germanic rulers that arrived and oppressed. And it, it's complete bullshit. Uh, there is no way to prove it uh, historically speaking, um, and all the evidence, hints, and traces show us a very different picture of a society was very well equilibrated, uh, at least mm, up to this point, because at this point it was also the contrary, that like in other Romano-Germanic kingdoms was the problem that there were, there was also with the uh, revival of the economy a certain elite that was kind of beginning to oppress the others, mm. but simply because they, mostly because of corruption, and it, there weren't those clientels, um, those massive clientels, like in the Gallic world, for instance, the at this point was ma mostly a matter of um, um, influential figures into society that could, I don't know, have an impact to try to 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 make um, certain people grow into their um, dependence. Um, uh, because of work and other dynamics of this sort, but was, what is evident here, you have the Longobards and the Romans that are treated as equals for w w what it meant, the participation to the army. And also in Carolingian times, because this w happened, this law of Heistulf is very close to actually the, the final Carolingian conquest of the Longobards, is you see that in Italy you could be, um, you could use every kind of um, there was this option you had. You could be judged either on the Frankish rule, uh, Fresh, Frankish law, Longobard law, or Roman law, and all these tr um, options were basically um, 
also other Germanic laws because there were also other uh, elements of that could be there um, coming from I don't know from Alamannia from from Bavaria and so on. And everybody could choose among these options. Sometimes, you, even if you belong to one of these um, um, uh, juridical ethnic groups, you could make a contract autonomously um, accor that that work according to another law. Maybe you were two longbirds, but you could make a contract in, in uh, according to the Frankish law if you wanted. And th this created a bit of a problem. But it's still a very very fluid system. It also helped paradoxically to administrate because, and it makes you understand that there weren't these differences between um, these people that were de facto all freemen um, at this point. So a very clear picture telling the truth also from the documentary evidence that uh, doesn't suggest any form of oppression f on based on juridical base at this point anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately we, we don't have enormous amount of evidence because in early medieval times guess what there is not and such changes however um, in fact we, we don't have this clear um, statement this clear rule from the, the, excuse me, this, this clear measure that was taken at the point that, that um, made essentially the, the Romans be uh, integrated en masse into the Longobard um, uh, community over the generations doesn't tell us that, that this didn't happen because this happened probably so naturally that it didn't even need a um, you know the, uh, a formalization um, and this is normal when you leave with those demic uh, proportions um, and uh, you obviously end up to leave among this population to it, it was most likely on the contrary the longer birds that kind of became make that they got mixed with with the rest of the population and that this population was all considered eventually as longer bird in the political practice by the sovereigns this is this is how it practically happened so everybody participated to uh, the army in practice. So this myth that the Romans were largely in, in Italy differently from Visigothic Spain, for instance, that were treated as servile, or at least at the best half free, and did not serve the army, is wrong. And there is no evidence of this whatsoever. And, and people who say this just get tricked by the fact that there is no further you know that the just uh, that that on a formal base the two juridical categories remain distinguished but they they have never studied the documentation they have never studied these contracts and thing and and haven't seen what the the society is so where that's where the myth is originated but now in 2019 we could also pick up a updated um academic work and start and read it because that's how and, and, sh and understand why this is wrong but no we have to stick to the to the prejudice we have to stick to the things we we you know we were impressed in our mind in the 18th in the 19th century because hey uh, why do what do we have a brain for like we can also make without it um, In general, the prejudices against the Longobards are very stupid, and in general, they all come from the also in here from from Rome, from letters that were written between the popes and the Byzantines um, when they were at war with the Longobards, or where they were writ writing to the Carolingians because uh, you know the the, uh, the pro-Frankish uh, pope had been elected and now was calling you know uh, the Franks into Italy against the Longobards that also had their faction into Rome that could elect its own pope that didn't make it. And so in here we find from these letters uh, uh, you know, yeah, the Longobards were terrible and, and so on, but I mean, can't you distinguish the what was, by the way, the average uh, political propaganda in the Middle Ages from, you know, what it really was? Study history, Wally, not never think that history is, you know, quoting a source completely out of context, uh, just taking it literally and, and ignoring all the, the rest. Because I know it's easy, 
you know every every idiot can do it so it's uh, the, you know but that's not how history is made uh, to, to tell it all so just let's look at what longbirds were for real and let's see that they they were actually probably one of the most civilized if not actually most civilized romano germanic kingdom at that point um, given their accomplishment in law in administration in civil rule and in maintaining public order so just read for instance the uh, rotary's edict it, it's beautiful read by the way makes you understand it opens your eyes on that on that society so this class of recruitment are very very interesting and the majority as uh, you know of the longbird army would serve as uh, as infantry in numerically speaking and then there was this cavalry that was partly you know armored cavalry and re the rest the majority lighter cavalry there is a bit of debate whether the uh, you know w what degree of um, um, how m how much cavalry existed originally uh, let's say at the time of the conquest of Italy in the Longobard armies um, this is also another thing we don't know because um, as far as we see the Longobards an ex had an extremely strong um, horse riding culture at that point and the Longobards together with the Goths etc were recognized uh, as one of the best cavalrymen um, um, among the, Ger the Germans mm -hmm. If not the best, these very two peoples, the Goths and the Longobards, were conceived as such, and even the f and, and this is something that was living on as a legacy in theory, mm -hmm. for which even in, in Carolingian times, when the Carolingians were interacting with was, was what was left of the Visigoths and and of the Longobards, they recognized these equestrian traditions by saying that essentially the Franks weren't like that. You know, that traditionally the Franks indeed, and this is true, the Franks originally had a very low amount of cavalry compared to other Germanic populations. Then now they were increasing it for mostly political and social reasons, not because they had a progressed tradition, but they still recognize the Gothic and Longobard prowess in, on horseback. What's the, p the point in here? The point is indeed at the beginning, you know, during the migration era, these populations were horse riding peoples. The point though is how many of these pe mm, of these people actually could afford a horse? And this is an answer we, we don't know because from the archaeological finds naturally we find horses bury buried with the uh, their their warriors. Um we find also Longobard art it's full of uh, pictures of uh, horsemen etc we find lots of, of bows and arrows together with with uh, uh, horsemen and this tells us that these were very heavily influenced by the steppe uh, warfare but how many could really afford a horse because we're still talking about the migration era I mean these weren't fully nomadic populations these weren't like the Huns these were still Germans that had received this very substantial influence from the steppe and that obviously so the horse also is a sort of status symbol um, you know that the Germans in, at the beginning made a, a, a very contained use of cavalry especially Western Germans and that's why also the, the Franks for instance at the beginning didn't have much of it I say much but it's not that they didn't have it on the contrary probably the the people that made least use of cavalry were like the the Anglo-Saxons or the Scandinavians uh, but they still did use that contrarily why it was commonly thought that the Anglo-Saxons and the Scandinavians did use cavalry, also more extensively than what is, what is usually believed. But it's obvious that they were a bit different, and even the same Longobards, however, and, and this is the point, it, it, it's irrealistic to believe that they were all fighting on horseback at one point, because it's impossible. Um, there is no population in the area that is witnessed to have had all horses. M unlike, you know, these populations on the steppes the, where the horse is like the standard thing, many Longobard burials show us that these were infantrymen. 
or maybe there were certain uh, tools that were related to the horse, like stirrups and other, um, I don't know, the uh, br the bite and, and so on. But m most of the of, of the Longobard Arimani would be, in my opinion, infantrymen anyway. And in, in, in it's really a matter of a logistical problem in the sense that horses are extremely expensive to upkeep. It's not that you cannot have a horse as, as a normal thing unless you don't have these huge cattle, but we, we don't have a... These weren't... That there is no evidence to suggest that that society was like the full one of the steps. Because many evidence tells us that uh, foot combat... Uh, by the way, I uh, it w was pretty widespread. In fact, the same... Um, I made a video on the longbirds that it should be also in the same Longbird playlist, that is um, the chapter of the Strategicon um, dedicated to the so-called blonde-haired peoples that were at this point actually the world Germans, uh, but probably and preferably the Longbirds because they were the ones that at the time of the Strategicon the Byzantines were in greatest contact with, hmm, both as enemies and as auxiliaries. and. And you realize it, it says there that how these peoples fought, and the majority of them fought on foot. I don't remember with it, whether it's expressly stated, but it tells it. You know, it was infantry formations, maybe uh, thickly packed, like it would be normal. So it's obvious that um, these populations were not fully horse riding um, peoples um, into battle, and most of them would be on foot. Like, the German average had always been. Um, what happened into Italy is that, first of all, um, this was a very different environment. It was more sedentary. There were mo more resources, more surplus. That's the point with this uh, equestrian tradition um, essentially dies out in the practice. It's something that happens also within certain populations that maintain a very strong cavalry over time. If you take the Persians, for instance, those came from, from the steppes, originally speaking. When they settle into Persia, they keep a, a very strong cavalry, but still this is a very different cavalry from the one that they had in the steppe. In the case of Italy, um, things changed at so many levels for which um, this very warlike nature of the people kind of begins to die out mm. um, because they were a, a, an ethnic minority because they blended with they, they sedentarized they mixed with the rest of the population who was sedentary since you know millennia at that point um, and that's it Th this happened in, into to everyone mm. uh, even the gods by the way Italy is not a great country for horses I mean Italy always had, in, in, in at this times, good, I would say good breeds, but not the spaces for for serving a, a very consistent bodies of cavalry. It's the same reason why the Romans initially didn't have great numbers of cavalry, albeit their cavalry was rather strong. And this had been a problem, for instance, for the Ostrogoths, that we, as we have said, were also pretty, um, you know, they, they, they had in their tradition very, uh, very good, cavalry coming from the steppes having been under the Huns will surprise them and their cavalry for uh, highly and regarded it uh, highly that in Italy didn't, they didn't have they, didn't, they had other things they had the Roman indu military um, fabrics the industries sorry they, they had all these things but they also had to change a bit their military uh, also because the especially when they had to fight into Italy during the Byzantine invasion, they uh, they had to fight into a, a land. It's also pretty difficult because the Apennine Peninsula is a nightmare for every army, and plus at that time it was also full of cities of fortified positions that they didn't have in the steppes. So they also had to learn how to use siege weapons, uh, fleets, a bit disastrously. Telling the truth, eventually they mostly resorted successfully to guerrilla, and that's why uh, you know eventually Italy went destroyed into the process um, this scorched land and all this stuff so this society was changing however this happened to the Visigoths and so on the idea of cavalry however was definitely um, still very alive in 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 Longobard Italy at all times 
I mean, the ideal Freeman was a cavalryman in Longobard art, in Longobard politics. That's what they still kept picturing th themselves as. And they probably did some good extensive use of cavalry. We also find, interestingly enough, uh, certain saxes um, that uh, are extremely long, um, uh, up to 70 centimeters. They look more like sabers, mm -hmm. the ones that uh, the neighboring armors uh, used, for instance. And that's an excellent uh, weapon for uh, to fight on horseback with. Um, and so, obviously, cavalry remained. Cavalry existed all over Western Europe. It's, it's just that it wasn't so well cohesive and trained and effective like it had been in the past. Um, and at this point, it's not even a matter of saying, oh, well, that was a bad uh, cavalry. No, because f for as much as we know, those standards were fairly good. And it wasn't even a matter of individual prowess. As much as we know, a um, you know uh, individually a Longobard cavalryman, even from the from the eighth century, probably knew how still how to fight pretty effectively in horseback. The, the real problem now was that there was no professional um, uh, army. Mm -hmm. um, differently from what happened in Gaul, where there were these military retinues that were maintained uh, in shape, also effectively, from a professional point of view, by the local noblemen, who had maintained a freaking lot of land, because Gaul was much more stratified than Italy, as we have seen, um, in society. So th there were these leaders, these, oli uh, these aristocrats, that had their military retinues they could pay, and they were maintained on the back of other people that had to work for that aristocrat. In Italy it wasn't nothing like that. Uh, the same Longobard king had much less uh, land than the average Frankish nobleman. Just think of this relation. And the Frankish cavalry, at this point the Carolingian cavalry, was being reshaped ex essentially on the basis of how much land you had. So it's obvious that the Longobards couldn't have the same um, Carolingian cavalry. And it's not even a matter of equipment, because that's really the last thing. It's about, really, the collective training. It's the fact that the Carolingians now had an army of professionals that fought every single year, uh, going back and forth across uh, Europe, continuously fighting every kind of enemy, and making a living out of that, mm? and spending their whole life on horseback to fight or to train for fighting. No, no other Germanic population at this point had anything like this. So the they all had cavalry, but this cavalry had was much less trained, much less cohesive, much less um, effective in collective forma information than the Carolingian one. Another very strange thing is that, unfortunately, we uh, don't have any idea of what the Longobard armor, uh, let's say, equipment of the 8th century really was because of that of aforementioned reason of the lack of archaeological evidence due to Christianization, so to, due to the um, uh, disappearance of uh, weapon in, in the graves, in graves. Um, but we have no reason that to believe that the Longobards had a substantially different equipment from the one of the, Longo uh, of the Franks. The Franks historically had had this kind of much very Western outlook uh, in the sense that they had a coat of mail, you know they, they looked pretty much like the Roman cavalrymen, and they they had some elements of the sep maybe more, but this was present also in 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 the Romans as well. And instead, what we see from the Longobards is that the Longobards had a, 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 a as we have seen a very strong steps influence. They had lamellar armor very extensively, also depicted in two sources and so on. So this. Uh, men who look could have been even Siberians for what we can uh, see, you know, because th they're indistinguishable. Uh, such kind of armor are is pr has still existed uh, into Asia, you know, up to the 20th century. I mean, it's, it's always been there, historically speaking, something that survived the millennia. That was the typical character of the steppe. At this point, however, there is no reason to think the, the Longobards spent so uh, that obviously you know, pertain to the elite, the average Longobard cavalryman, even in, uh, in the 6th century would have worn essentially probably no no armor, but just an helmet, a shield, a sword, lance, and javelins and, and sacks, that was the the average equipment, probably, but uh, they, uh, we, we have no evidence, and 
and, and sometimes even the pictures that I put you today in here, you see this kind of almost invariable um, uh, lamellar um, armor, for which, as if every single <laughs> longboard um, aristocrat had had to wear it, but, you know, it's not necessary. Obviously, also in this 6th century, there were other um, other other kind of armor. Um, and, uh, however, this figures prominently as a type, um, and we have to, we often associate it. This is something, if, if, for, for instance, the Nieder Bieber helmet is um, something was found actually in an Alamannic grave, if I'm not wrong. So, also in here, the, the Germans had pretty pretty similar equipment uh, at this point, especially these ha that had been more influenced by the Hans, by the Sarmatians, they, they shared, they had this kind of um, kind of equipment. The problem is, we ha in fact, we have no evidence to, s to say what th this, um, this iconography, uh, this um, evidence stops at a certain point. But we have to think that probably a Carolingian and a Longobard Knights uh, um, from the 8th century didn't differ much in the substance. Mm. And they, uh, uh, in, a, in terms of equipment, the, the, the Franks had famously this brunia that were practically a, a mix of um, iron, leather, and other iron buckles, I mean, to strengthen it. We don't have a clear picture idea of what it really was, but still, I mean, yeah, we, we also have an idea, but this kind of equipment kind of could vary a lot as well. Also, the Franks at this point were fighting with so many enemies that it's difficult even to say, okay, well, there were so many different influences, it was nothing excess, extremely typical. When you look at material culture in the early medieval times, you realize it was extremely homogeneous in many ways. So there are certain like these ones, certain uh, secondary uh, features that can appear more or less prominently in a people, you can say, oh well, that's distinguished, but you don't have it to 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 take it um, to take the matter to, to to this of how these guys were equipped because it's, that's not important. The, the most important thing is how much they're trained. The equipment comes secondary and. Uh, the equipment is something that doesn't substantially change the outcome of, of a of a clash, um, and you can't say it was a matter of equipment. Uh, technology is always the the uh, the last thing in, in military affairs. Um, um, so the idea, especially of cavalry uh, being, however, very important in the sixth century, is also confirmed. But I mean, confirmed is suggested by several elements, including the fact that the um, troops that we mentioned before, these twenty-five hundred warriors uh, that served into the Byzantine armies, were served by three thousand retainers. Um, this can suggest um, this very um, kind of um, lordly, lord, I don't, I don't know to say this, but it's as if these um, were knights with their own squires in practice. Um, so a world uh, into which the idea that the knight uh, had to rule and to have these servants and to be uh, this kind of um, um, archetype of the perfect warrior and so on is was something very rooted at, the, at that point um, and the, the this num numbers can be al also interpreted maybe as you know me uh, in, a, in a more flexible way in the sense that this 3000 retainers might have been I don't know what it, it normally was the Infantry complement that was uh, coming uh, along with these warriors, and there is actually not much difference in, in practice because it's obvious that um, um, these were still sort of retainers. Or that, however, they uh, these um, 2,500 troops were uh, they were mostly cavalry from from what we know. So they also numerical relation they dominated because a cavalryman at this point is still stronger than, than an infantryman or a retainer. Maybe this retainer were mounted as well? I don't know. It would be interesting to know. However, 
it's also pretty obvious that the majority of the Longbird army this time would be made up by um, would present a much higher uh, proportion of of infantrymen than cavalrymen, uh, much more than what is seen in, in in this contingent that was sent essentially. Also, I don't know, probably also as a picked uh, war band because this is the truth: is that these were the troops that were sent by the Longobards to help the Byzantine allies into Italy against the Goths. So maybe they wanted also to show off a little bit or maybe these were just mercenaries who knows um, um, into so something we didn't say is the is about the clanic organization however of the Longbird army that um, aside from these uh, relations of dependence that we have seen now between the knight and the retainer was um, however rather um, homogeneous in, in some ways uh, from a social po point of view. Um, what I mean is that the, the Longobard people at this point in 6th century was um, divided into several clans. Mm -hmm. um, these clans had um, you know several affiliations that they had been f they had been formed throughout the migration um, according to dynamics, we can't fully see, but there was, these were probably open clans. They had naturally a familiar um, relation. There was a familiar relation within them, but there were also these other uh, aggregated uh, elements that you know were adopted by this great extended family. Let's say, and they worked a bit on their own. Um, these groups were called as fare in Latin. It was the Latinization of a Germanic term that um, is connected to the verb, um, even today's German, uh, fahren, which means to travel. Mm -hmm. And this stresses um, how, and this was the elementary, this was essentially the bulk of the, uh, the, new, uh, the base of, uh, of um, the Longbird society. Mm -hmm. Because these were autonomous, we have seen there was a very few uh, centralization. There was there were the aristocracies were relatively weak, and so these fare were so um, autonomous in there, and they were used during the migration era to be completely self-sufficient, even from a logistical point of view. These were people who could essentially uh, survive into the wilderness throughout their own, you know, skill, know-how, and natural lot also violence as well and and that's also why that war was so violent because indeed there were very few resources and there were these continuous clashes for fighting over the resources for survival and so on so these were um, groups that had formed in an extremely functional way in order to make society live on and survive they had a very intense a very high level of military degree of militarization so these clans, when they arrived into Italy, they, I mean, some of them naturally followed certain greater, they all had a leader on their own, um, but these leaders would in turn follow another leader, like Albovin could have been. So it was a matter of, you know, political interest, uh, whatever, you know, some preferred to stick with Albovin, others went in other parts of Italy. Others actually even cro uh, crossed into Gaul to be actually annihilated by the... Um, the franco burgundians uh, in, into an ambush and and um, and however maintaining generally speaking this autonomous character and especially those longbirds who fled down, I mean who poured down um, into the Apennine uh, Peninsula from from the Po Valley were essentially pretty autonomous they were also the ones who made probably the greatest mess in terms of, you know, they had to find a way through and they slaughtered everybody who was in the middle, the Byzantine Ammon Post, also part of the, we can imagine the local militias that were formed at a point to stop them. And those were the ones that was, were probably more heinous, that they, they destroyed the the Abbey of Monte Cassino, for instance, um, for the first time. And they, um, so those were kind of wild. Um, uh, and uh, they and and it's very interesting because in today's Italy there are still several places that 
are called after this fare. Mm. Uh, the name of fara is a common Italian uh, toponym that uh, essentially tells you that in that place there had been a longer bird um, clan that had settled down. Um, so at this point also Italy remained quite of a militarized area for, for a long time because essentially it was this great um, it was everything was a kind of frontier especially in the Apennine area because um, there was these corridors of um, Byzantine avant-posts that connected Ravenna with Rome and also other centers scattered around the peninsula so uh, those were also very difficult grounds uh, among the mountains and so on, so very difficult places even to fight. So in this guerrilla, these um, skirmishers were ambushes and s s stuff like that were all over the place. Mm -hmm. And they and they contributed to, to give a military shape also to, to certain areas and the, the way they were inhabited and so on. Um, at this point, however, the the bulk of the Longobard Kingdom kind of was organized in a more, mm, you know, orderly fashion that in part kind of remained in also in the other uh, places by standards because the Fares keep the Fare kept, kept you know being remaining at, uh, up to a certain point. However, as the pretty the standard military organization of the Longobards, especially at the beginning, but in in the north the uh, kings and uh, the first king of uh, of of the Longobards in this, in this sense was Authory because there was Albavin, then Clefis, and they were both assassinated. And then there was this um, moment of ten years of anarchy be between 574 and 584, um, where no king was elected, then was elected Authory. And Authory was an extremely effective king. Um, he uh, he literally slaughtered uh, half of the I mean, all the Longobards, rebel dukes that were in the Paul Ballet that were siding with the Byzantines, he decapitated them all. Um, he was an extremely effective ruler. He massacred um, all these opponents. And from that point on, he, nobody ever questioned the, the existence and the authority of the Longobard kings. Um, the, the Paul Ballet was a pretty good good uh, place to start a kingdom from because even though it wasn't so you know the Pau Valley was a bit less um, um, let's say central and southern Italy were substantially a bit better but the Pau Valley present because Pau Valley had remained also relatively uh, marginal to the Mediter Mediterranean traffic in the late um, Roman period had uh, declined a, a little bit. The swamps had come back. You know this this area with lots of rivers, and also, the f but um, it still had um, very solid um, Roman cities in there. Some of the greatest cities in Europe at this time were in in, in northern Italy. Um, it was defended by by the Alps that were formidable. Um, um, obstacle to the invaders. In fact, the same Longobards, like basically anyone else who invaded Italy, didn't practically cross the the you know the toughest areas, but they went into the Pannonian Plain. And from there, they passed this into this uh, kind of milder uh, pass into you know between uh, what would be today's uh, Slovenia and uh, in northern Italy um, to enter the Po Valley and, and this was well defend well defendable it was full of rivers that also in here could help to, to put up a defense there was a, a very strong defensivistic attitude in this sense a very I, 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 from from the side of the Longobards, even when the Franks and the Byzantines invaded them it was enough for them to to close themselves into the uh, into their own uh, cities, uh, fortified cities uh, in, in the Po Valley and to let the uh, Franco-Byzantine army, first of all, not even to uh, reach each other and then to simply um, be worn out by the, the epidemics and so on. So it, it was a, a very good place um, actually to 
to de to defend in many ways. Uh, and then they 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 began to expand into Liguria and to Tuscany. It also became under the direct rule of of uh, Pavia, that was the capital. Also, in here there were certain um, duchies that were initially autonomous and then were framed within you know the uh, the kingdom solidly. Um, at this point, the military organization of the kingdom was based on um, the idea that the dukes had to give that there were first of all royal estates that the king could draw resources from. Then also the dukes had to contribute always with to the army, because technically uh, the Germanic pop you know all, uh, um, all these people was considering still itself as one, and by Germanic tradition. Um, when war was uh, called, you know, everybody had to, war was declared, everybody was called up to the army, and every freeman had theoretically to participate. Now, this was very theoretical, in fact, but still, every duke was meant to provide his own troops. Now, the dukes, initially, as we've seen, were all these, um, the duchies were all these um, political entities that had formed around um, the Roman city and its diocese and its district. Um, there were several. There were, um, I think, there were something like um, 34 duchies by the f by 574. Um, so not a few, but they were still each. They were still kind of. Um, um, the also in here, the geography of the duchies ch changed a little bit because usually. Um, um, <laughs> and saying the Po Valley, there were more duchies, but they were smaller, so they were also easier to control individually. The larger duchies were the ones of Benevent of Spoleto. They were kind of two big chunks on their own. They were s sensibly larger than than the others. Like they would have been essentially a, like from two or five times the size of a normal duchy. Then also the one of Friuli was pretty pretty big and was also among the, probably the most militarized in, in Longobard Italy and in fact was the one where the Longobard military traditions survived more intact also because it was a less urbanized place it's as if it had been more a piece of um, of Germany than Italy just to, to make it um, to make you understand it by an approximation um, so that's also where the Longbirds kind of maintain a bit of their own original lifestyle. Um, and also, but that happened mostly, also in there the Longbirds mixed quite easily, and even before, telling the truth, than in other, uh, to the, with the Romans, than in other regions. In fact, it's very interesting to see how probably the distinction between Longbirds and Romans remained, paradoxically, in the most Romanized lands, because there were more resources more surplus to make that elite remaining at the top. Mm -hmm. Instead, in this kind of wilder, um, less urbanized areas, paradoxically, the Longobards mix much more easily with the population because they were kind of more alike. And these duchies were uh, revolving around the former districts of the Roman administration, so they, they were actually pretty useful to control uh, the whole peninsula by controlling them. Um, so the duke had normally to bring his own army, his own retinue. It was conceived a bit as a private retinue uh, to the public army. A private retinue because this stemmed essentially from the clan, from the idea that the duke was at the head of a clan or several clans that had followed him in this kind of pers personal bondage. But over time, the Longobard kings from Pavia were developing a bureaucracy and administration and were sending certain functionaries called um, Gastaldi, who um, were meant essentially to, um, to represent a sort of um, royal authority within every duchy. So they had a palace on their own and they were um, mostly put there for um, um, for uh, legal reasons, and 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 their duty was to control that the dukes would ensure justice according to the Longobard Edict, so to the right the right of the Longobard people. That had been decided 
uh, in theory, by the National Assembly of the Longobards, uh, representing in, therefore the, the, the Longobard identity and how the, the Longobard people had to live. So every subject that was um, disaffection with the, its own duke could go to the um, Gast. Uh, those, uh, of uh, the uh, of the duchy, and that was the palace of the Gastald was essentially as if it was the same royal palace of Pavia. This was the idea conceptually. So the Gastald um, communicated to the king what was going on, and the king could take very harsh measures to um, uh, to ensure uh, the justice would be done. Um, and um, the Longobard kings were very deeply involved into these juridical activities, and they and they sentenced uh, a lot. They they cared a lot about the law, the administration, and its administration worked because you could even go, you know, to if the local castle couldn't do anything against the duke, could uh, every uh, Longobard subject could go to Pavia, to the royal palace, and to be heard by the king, and this is literally ha what happened because we have the proof from the do documents and and and, and in, in this way the king could you know interfere into the ducal um, affairs and to uh, essentially make its power uh, the royal power increase within the duke the, the, the duchies through the uh, gastaldi and sometimes when the dukes uh, the ducal dynasties died out it was the royal um, Gastald that seized the ducal power, and certain duchies at this point were ruled directly through the Gastald by the king, mm -hmm. and this happened very frequently. And 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 in, uh, you see, if you see Longobard history in perspective, that there was a, a very strong increase in centralization through this process. Um, also, because those clanic bonds were, you know, essentially being lost over the the generations, so the the majority of the population wanted to be ruled equally effectively and as we've seen before also this population was gradually becoming Longobard so all the r former Romans now were also Longobard subjects and they wanted the Duke who uh, ruled them fairly hmm? um, so in in the absence of the Duke it was the Gastald who led the army of the Duchy and then there were other uh, functionaries like the uh, centenari or the cani and so on that were essentially um, this uh, Latin names that were used also into the Roman army that reflect uh, this decimal organization that existed even also in the Roman uh, excuse me in the Longobard army. Um, sometimes, especially in s in in the among the southern Longobards, you find the term of comes that is actually the only um, Roman officer's name that it was imported into the Longobard army, but only in these southern uh, regions. Um, the reason seems to have been that um, actually a, um, a number of Longobards uh, had been settled into the um, into southern Italy even before that the um, the the entirety of the Longobard people migrated into the Po Valley, and these were probably some of the same Longobard uh, mercenaries that the Byzantines were had had used during the Cod Gothic War, and that were now settled into the depopulated peninsula to control it and to make them pay taxes and so on. So these areas were kind of more Romanized than the north, and therefore eventually when the uh, the Longobards invaded Italy, uh, these southern Longobards kind of seized power also in their own their own and they maintained partly this title of commerce that was found in into the Roman army as well and uh, so theoretically um, there was still the fara at the base of the organization but um, this also began to, to vanish obviously because the clans and the related family groups eventually kind of blended in with the rest of the population and even if Initially, these troops were organized, uh, this, and the Longobard armies were organized on this base. Eventually, they kind of were organized more on a uh, patrimonial base, as we've seen, or on on base on the city district. And um, and naturally, every community even had its own ways. They they were practically uh, practically organized. Towards the end of the Longobard kingdom, there is also the appearance of certain. Um, 
I wouldn't even know how to say this. These were basically some aristocrats, an aristocratic class that uh, was known as with the name of Gazindi, mm -hmm. uh, singular Gazindius. Um, now, these uh, um, also in this Gazindi, a lot has been said. You know, they were etc. Also, the older historiography believed that this was a sort of military class equivalent to a bit like one of the uh, like the one of the Carolingian comites for instance so a sort of vassals of the king because objectively um and this gazindi had um were sort of um, the, the king's trustees in in some way and um, sometimes they um you know they they, they have been its military nat uh, nature has been kind of overly emphasized who were these people? Were substantially these were a new class of aristocrats of people who um, had a, uh, a let's say a certain weight within the local communities. These were magnates or other people who had power and, and money and stuff. Always very contained, as we have seen. Part of the success of the uh, Longobard kingdom, from an institutional point of view, was too that there was there were no uh, powerful aristocracies that could compete with the one of the king. Uh, this Gazindi, in fact, emerged mostly from the uh, from the uh, cities, for, from the urban classes, um, and they um, that those aristocracies had remained kind of strong even during the moment of greater depression of the ur urban centers during early medieval times, and especially by the early eighth century, when there is also this uh, economical revival of especially from especially in Italy, um, before the, in other European lands. Um, this kind of, um, um, mm, let's say, um, I don't even know how to call them, the, uh, say, magnates, or however these are aristocrats, were uh, becoming quite useful as a reference point for the public administration. Mm. They were becoming more powerful, having substantial clienteles, especially within, as, as we've seen, the city centers, that were center of Longbird power, uh, differently from the Frankish one, that were s essentially landed um, rural um, uh, aristocracies, and that um, had a particular relation with the king, also m m pledging their alliance, uh, allegiance by um, oaths and so on. And some of them had definitely an, a, a military nature. Uh, we don't have to be so radical also in here, but uh, let's say that they don't have to be um, exchanged necessarily as a kind of military class. They, they also had ci mostly actually civil functions. Mm -hmm. And even if they were rich enough naturally to, to have also their own military regiments, this is very important. In Longobard history you see that Usually, every duke, every uh, every important person in, in the had its own retinue. Mm -hmm. Some of them, they, they they already went around even with arms, even in church. You know, they, it was well, it was normal at the time even to enter in church with weapons and so on. But I'd say that they um, this kind of degree of th there had always being a sort of militarization of the Longbird society in, in some way, even when this went diluted over time um, w with this indentarization. And so this Gazindi represented sometimes the, um, the very important connection for the king also to mobilize uh, the army, certain communities and so on. And so probably they also had important military duties and so on. There were then other um, service military services that were required especially towards the end of the um of the longbird kingdom where things became kind of uh, more agitated seemingly the number of um especially when the franks invaded the the kingdom then there was also an increase in uh, uh, in 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 crime you know in bands of brigands and so on and this was known as the service was known as the caballicazio that is essentially like the chevauché um, and, and this idea it was a sort of police service uh, owed by the local communities to the king and that is something that remains also later in time because this was present in every uh, germanic kingdom and also the carolingians had it so um, the um uh, this um Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Uh, this um, 
ride, this horse ride, because that's what the Cabalicazio means, was to remain at the base, actually, also the military organization of the of the Italian communes later on, and so on. It was something pretty ancient, and also stemmed from, from, from the Longobards, in fact. And this was old. It, interestingly, this was a mounted service, so also it, those who had to provide it had to, to know how to fight on horseback, and, and so on. Um, then there were also other uh, smaller, uh, also minor guards um, that were mostly um, living um, close to uh, bridges and other important passages that uh, were known as the saltari, for instance, that had basically to check uh, all the people who crossed the bridge, the road, also to s for stopping criminals and, and so on. Um, then, um, looking a bit of the higher at the higher echelons, we we don't have a, a very clear view of this. Surely, there were certain officers um, of high rank that were known. For instance, the Marpais. Mm -hmm. The Marpais is would be the equivalent of the Frankish Count of the Stable. Mm -hmm. So he was the commander of the uh, Longobard cavalry. And this is, however, I think it's mentioned only one time, just for telling you how the sources are scanning, especially about military affairs, was a title that we find, I think, in correspondence of the Duke uh, Gisulf, who was uh, no one but, I think, Albovin's nephew, and was left into uh, Friuli uh, during the Longobard invasion of Italy, so in the northeast, going while Albovin was going to the west, together with most of the Longobard cavalry, very interestingly, because this was um, essentially used as a reserve, because at that point, the, the, first of all, the invasion could go, could go wrong. Also, Longobards were probably worried about the others that might have act the sneakily on them, so it's very interesting that in Friuli this uh, cavalry was also meant to, to stay there, and maybe, I don't know, it, it triggered some kind of local, um, you know, organization that also is reflected by the greatest uh, degree of militarization of the local, um, of the local so uh, society. Um, but I, I, I repeat, this term of Marpa is, I think it, it is present only in there. Then there was the shield board, that would be the shield bearer uh, or armor bearer in the standard bearer. So these officers are quite kind of, you know, uh, shield bearers, armor bearers, and sergeant bearers were pretty much, you know, present in any army <laughs> of the world at this point on, on so many levels. But these were also you know, meant to the one, the ones of the king, so the ones who also had not just a military function, but also uh, lived in the palace, they had this power in, in, on their own, and they also had administrative ch um, offices and, and, and so on. Um, so, um, this is more or less the, the uh, Longobard military organization in theory, then in practice I could use, I could add many more details, but I think the video is getting excruciating long, so I have to cut it short. We will probably look at it um, on another occasion when I'll start to do this dedicated um, videos on, on the Longobards. Uh, but let's say that the Longobard um, army was relatively efficient, even at a certain time the, the Longobards besieged Rome and other fortified centers, and you, from the sources we know that um, practically, this um, Longobard contingents um, um, f f flowed into the into into the theater of, of the operations from all the parts of Italy. So there was no, which is pretty much obvious because if you have you know if your capital is in Pavia. You don't wait. It's it's useless to 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 wait. You know, from a guy from the I don't know Duchy of Benevent to send its own troops from southern Italy to the northern Italy and then to go back to Rome. You know, it's a, a useless uh, waste of uh, <laughs> of resources and so on. So they they basically took you know agreement and to fight it with joint forces in in, in a particular place. And to, uh, in fact, that's how, for instance, how the sieges of Rome were done. You know that every uh, Longobard um, corp basically came and bes to besiege the city from the direction where it was coming, essentially. 
And the fact that the Longbirds were able even to besiege a city like Rome, it was pretty huge uh, still for those um, early medieval standards, but also because the, 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 the walls were standing, theoretically, was still this local Byzantine uh, garrisons, even though uh, now it was mostly the Romans and also other uh, foreign elements within from, from Western Europe that uh, were at the service of the papal militias at this point that um, could guard them. So it's important because it seems that the Longbirds had a relatively, you know, well efficient um, military machine, at least in logistical and organizational terms. Mm -hmm. Then, as we've seen, the, the military average was not higher than the average uh, was uh, of Western Europe, but we have no way to tell whether it was even, uh, you know, uh, uh, worse than the average. We have no no evidence. It was was a kingdom that kind of worked and uh, was able to move its armies and progressively to eat up all the biz all the rest of uh, you know of uh, the Italian territory was still under Byzantine control and and just the Franks arrived basically to uh, to uh, to abort this process otherwise um, they they would have seized uh, the control of the whole peninsula. Um, other things, um, mercenaries. Um, definitely, Longobards used foreign mercenaries at some time. You've seen how they eager they were to integrate other populations. Um, they were used, first of all, as mercenaries by the, by the Byzantines, so they were also pretty well a acquainted with, um, you know, the the Roman military practices. And objectively, there wasn't much of a difference between a Longobard Arimannus or a Byzantine Caballarius uh, in the sixth century. You know, in terms of equipment and and military capabilities and multitasking, uh, you know, training and and so on. Um, and definitely, also the the Byzantine areas um, militias um, had the uh, they grew pretty, I mean, they grew osmotically pretty similar to, to the Longobards as well. So it wasn't this huge difference telling the truth. As I was saying before, material culture was pretty much homogeneous at this point. Um, after their settlement in Italy, actually, the Longobards didn't venture much elsewhere. elsewhere. There is that expedition in Provence to assist the Franks against the Muslims. Um, there is... It's actually very few, and uh, the, the, their, the, you know, the mindset of the, of the Longobards was firmly set on Italy when they s they created the kingdom. They understood that territorially speaking, that was their, uh, you know, their goal, and it's kind of strategically obvious. And if they had not been crushed by the the Carolingians, uh, probably they would have expand finished to expand into southern Italy, and then probably extend their influence in the Adriatic Sea. Um, the Albite, they uh, objectively the the, the few t uh, the Longbirds had uh, their um, some navy uh, they had, especially at the beginning uh, during the sixth century there was a uh, certain dukes um, when they conquered Tuscany and and P in the city of Pisa that was on the sea at that time. And they seized certain um, Byzantine galleys, and they used it to launch raids on Sardinia, on Byzantine-held Sardinia. This is very interesting because if we have, uh, I think, a, a letter from uh, Gregory the uh, the Great that writes to to the Byzantine saying, you know, watch out. No, it, he was writing actually to the um, to the bishop of of, of Cagliari in, to Sardinia, saying, watch out because there are these Longobard pirates and so on. And the Longobards had some interest in into Sardinia and so on, and they actually also seized Corsica at a certain point, even though we have no idea exactly when it happened, but they extended their power over there. Um, initially, there was not much of an interaction with the Muslims. Um, Liutbrand made something to retake certain relics from the Saracens. They sent, he sent an expedition to something. We don't know whether it was a military... Uh, thing or it, it was achieved through diplomacy um, but mostly you know the, the horizons of the Longobards were set into Italy and they were extremely cautious also about controlling their mountain passes oh well they fought against the Bavarians actually the Longobards expanded yeah towards um, the um, 
uh, you know, in, in the Alps, they seized from the ba uh, from the variance some lands on the Danubian watershed of the Alps. So they passed from the other side, and they the Bavarians were less powerful than Longobards. Albeit, um, on the Western Alps, actually, the um, Carolingians maintained always the con um, the Franks maintained the control on the um, water on the Italian watershed of the Alps. That is that. Just like today's border, um, and this is t today's border between France and Italy is, is in the same way because normally the border is is, is on a watershed. Mm -hmm. Instead, the border here is um, different because the um, from the Carolingian times, the Franks always had the upper hand um, on whoever was con uh, ruling on Italy. So the the French border stops basically almost at the uh, end of the. Alps on the Italian side, and this has, has started from this stemmed from the uh, Carolingian Longobard relations. The Longobards controlled the Alps in with certain mm, garrisons. It was actually a defense in depth, as we have seen. It was no thing like a proper border, uh, and this was quite effective because that allowed also, you know, at this time even a small fort could, you know, could have a uh, great, you know, impact there were certain Byzantine garrisons that remained besieged for decades, literally, uh, after the Longobard conquest into northern Italy, into the certain Alpine lakes that uh, exist in there. Um, ultimately, you know, it didn't even end in bloodshed; they simply <laughs> became friends in the end. Seriously, um, and uh, so it, it was a world that controlled mostly this, you know, political. Dynamics to to realign its defense and strictly military ones. Also, because maintaining a border uh, with a, you know, there were s certain um, ditches and so on. Especially when the Carolingians were about to to invade, the, the Longobards had built a certain valley there. So, and, and in fact, the Carolingians had difficulties at the beginning to to cross them because they had to find other passages in some way to to make it true. Um, and um, so. The, we will talk about this in detail as well. Um, the Longobards uh, had also these uh, shipbuilding capabilities that they never, in this sense, qu quite put into practice for strategic reasons because they were not interested to expand overseas in some way. But at a certain point, interestingly enough, they sent to the Amar um, Khan certain shipbuilders to build a fleet in the Danubian Delta in the Black Sea to use against the Byzantines. This is also very interesting and fascinating um, because the Longobards actually were friends with the Avars at most times. I mean, they obviously didn't like each other very much, but they still, you know, they had no reason to aggress each other because, uh, you know, the Longobards had left the, Pan the Danubian Basin for Italy. Also, uh, making an agreement with the Avars, uh, telling them that theoretically, if they had failed to expand into Italy, they would have come. They 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 would have maintained land into the Danubian plain. But I, I don't think that the Avars. Yeah, the, the Arabs says, uh, excuse me. The Avars said uh, yes because just to to get rid of them, um, but um, the. Uh, uh, I doubt that it would have, you know, uh, granted them new land as as a foreign, you know, as an autonomous power if they had come back from Italy. So that was just a kind of a way for Longobards to 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 ensure themselves some, you know, to have some assurance. But it wasn't probably very effective. But uh, for most, in the others were mostly instead cons. Uh, they they launched certain raids into Germany. The Merovingians had to counter a certain point, and mostly the Avars were um, uh, fighting on the Danubian frontier against the Byzantines, mm -hmm. and even coming to besiege Constantinople at a point. And the Avars were kind of the uh, most dangerous enemy of of the Byzantines at at, at some point in there. In this sense, by the way, the Avars had the same. The Longobards and the Avars were equally enemy to the Byzantines at one point, so that also explains it. Um, the, the Longobards did use artillery, um, the so-called petreries, so these um, engines manned by, you know, essentially working through muscular force, you know, pulling up these ropes and throwing 
with his arm uh, stones and during sieges and so on is was pretty much the standard and was in, in Europe at the time. Even the Byzantines made use of those, and Italy was. Um, as we were saying before, there were so many uh, Roman inf infrastructures still uh, standing. Uh, the same Byzantines had to besiege a city like Benevent uh, against the Longobards. Uh, Benevent resisted re uh, heroically against, let's say, the, uh, the, the Byzantine siege. Um, there are many anecdotes I could tell you about it, but, you know, Maybe it's not necessary now. Um, I was just thinking about other. No, this this is valid. So it, it you know, the longer but Italy presented this minimum of uh, engineering capabilities that were, you know, to be found essentially the most infrastructurally developed land in the West at that point. So, um, I mean, Western Europe. So it, it's was normal, but it's not that the Longobards ever put that in much practice. It was much more important to have a an efficient political and military system just to know how just to have a, an army to to levy and to uh, to 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 organize so also these technical skills were not excessively uh, they couldn't even be employed most of the time they were not needed uh, most of the times. Um, talking about foreign mercenaries instead, we've seen originally was plenty of um, other ethnicities in the Longobard army, especially of Germanic origin. Um, there were certain... Mm, also in here there was this Germanic practice sometimes of taking, of adopting the son of certain foreign um, princes that uh, for political reasons or international reasons um, that would be educated and trained as um, mostly trained let's say as warriors into the longer bird uh, world and that also became very strong um, strong uh, war, you know very prized uh, fighters um, uh, th there was a Swabian famously who participated, who was to who was raised among the Longobards, and, and instead passed on to the Byzantines and became uh, a Byzantine general. And also he led the army, I think, in Trace against the Avars, uh, and and his uh, he was buried in Ravenna with great honors by the Byzantines. Um, then there were others who were on occasion used as mercenaries. It's kind of normal because we can imagine there were others within the Longbirds also when they arrived in t into Italy because now the others had already settled into the Danubian plain. There was someone surely that crossed into the Longbirds in search of fortune to as mer mercenary and so on. Um, but these were mostly used as mercenaries into the uh, east, especially in the land of Friuli, that was so close to Hungary. In this, uh, I mean, at that point Hungary didn't exist as such, but you know, the the, the Pannonian uh, plain, nor the Angers were still <laughs> were already there. Um, and th there is also evidence of the um, of the Longobards making use of Slavs uh, as. Um, um, uh, against the Byzantines, the Slavs were also enemy of the Longobards most of the times on the eastern frontier. Um, they fought pretty harshly. In one battle, actually, the world frill and uh, nobility was wiped out by the uh, Slavs. But that's uh, also another anecdote because basically the Slavs were entrenched on the top of a of a hill, um, and th this was, you know. Uh, the Longobards were essentially quarreling against with each other, especially it was the commander who was uh, arguing with another aristocrat who had a name called uh, Argarit. And Arga in Longobard means coward. It is probably the, the most offensive word that existed in the Longobard vocabulary. And uh, since they were kind of conflictful against each other, they basically, you know, the, the commander, I think the Freelian du Duke said something like, you know, you, you're you an Arga by name and by fact, because you're a coward if you don't want to attack. And um, and he said, okay, let's see who is more 
arc up between us and he launched himself on this charge over hill against the slavs and the wolf real and army followed led by the duke so because of these stupid competitions basically the slavs just by throwing stones uh, against the uh, climbing longbirds basically annihilated them um but there were other episodes. Actually, the Avars came and launched some incursions into Freely, and at a certain point, they the, they raped, the, they devastated. So it was a pretty harsh time, and that's also what how probably the higher degree of militarization of Freely remains, and that's the reason why probably the Freely troops managed to to. Um, to defeat possibly even the Carolingian army at one point because they had had this very hard learned lesson uh, on that frontier that had shaped them in a more more efficient military fashion and the Friulan um, so better the, the Austrian dukes were generally regarded as very courageous um, fighters and all the Longobards admired the Friulan uh, nobility and in fact also Heistulf who came from Austria in fact Austria not meant the modern country but as we've explained to you northeastern Italy it was called at that time was uh, extremely praised a military commander was extremely fanatically loyal um, you know th th there was this idea that um, oh my there were so many anecdotes I would like to tell you but let's say these guys were really great capable commanders in, in, in it's very interesting because even the Carolingians originated from the eastern borders the one with the Saxons from this more uh, you know less urbanized and more militarized environment and it's fascinating that in this sense the, the Austrasians of Francia and the Austrians of Longobardy uh, kind of clashed eventually one against the other I mean Pippin the short fought against Heistulf twice and defeated him twice um, whatever, this is just my romanticism kicking in it. <laughs> um, so th there weren't actually many other ma um, mercenaries uh, used. In the 10th century, uh, when, during the time of the second invasions, so when the, actually the, Car um, you know, the, uh, the Longobard kingdom was over, and even the, the Carolingian empire was over, um, the, the southern Longobards hired certain majors, the hungers uh, that were raiding into Italy and some of them were hired successfully oh well I didn't say uh, yeah I said it before or the the Bulgars at a certain point were settled into central Italy during the seventh century this coming from the Balkans at the time but they weren't really mercenaries these were just you know they wanted a land to settle and the Longobards granted it to them because it was also convenient for them to to exploit the you know to populate that land um, there were very strong also perso personal bonds I mean, in this Germanic world. I mean, the idea that the Longobard king was not just the chief of a kind of ascetic um, kingdom that, you know, that, that this wa these were the Longobards as a people who granted you this kind of um, hospitality this it, it, it was all framed in this, this series of relations with in, international powers that actually were pretty intense during early medieval, medieval times um, in spite of what is thought and by the te at the 11th century so at the very end of Longobard history in the south also uh, as we have seen before Normans and even Germans were used as mercenaries in those uh, in the Longobard armies at the same time, it should be recalled that the same Carolingians uh, used the um, Longobards as uh, troops during the, their campaigns, and some of them were actually also elite troops. And when the Normans um, conquered southern Italy, there were still Longobard contingents that served under them and were quite prized. So it, this is very interesting as well, even as elite troops. Um, the relation with the Saracens is something that um, is more uh, direct only in, in the southern um, Longobards after the fall of the kingdom. Um, the Longobards did hire Saracen mercenaries and it's actually in 800, um, 
and that it's in um, the the first time the Saracens set on the Italian mainland occurred in 837 when um, Naples hired um, these troops. So Naples at that time was kind of borderline between still the Byzantine world and the Longobard one, so it's difficult to to say. But um, in general, the, um, the there was use of such uh, mercenaries were to be found pretty much everywhere at that point in the Mediterranean. Um, and naturally, also under the Carolingians, the uh, Longobard levy kept working on. Mm. Um, and in fact, there is this part that is also dramatically overlooked of um, Carolingian in Italic history, that is the uh, Carolingian kingdom of Italy, that was n nothing else but the same Longobard kingdom that survived under the Carolingians and was used by, eventually, when the Carolingian was w uh, empire was split, was ruled, excuse me, by Ludwig uh, II, and it had this, um, which also had a quite long reign, and and tried to make things work, even militarily speaking, and the, the in this Carolingian Kingdom of Italy managed, even among other things, to um, to retake uh, the city of Taranto, for instance, that had been conquered by Saracens, with huge uh, logistical difficulties and so on, because it was a complex operation and so on, but let's say that the Carolingians into Italy maintained um, in shape the administration f as much as they could naturally because also the war um, the conquest of Italy had ruined in part this this uh, system um, and um, also now the, the, the Carolingians were importing feudalism so they were changing radically the, uh, the equilibrium um, you know the Frankish counts were settled into some of the most important um, Longobard duchies, albeit not all at once. Actually, the Carolingians maintained many Longobard dukes on their throne when they entered into Italy because they didn't want to upset them and Italy could rebel quite easily, so they kind of were a bit more light handed um, on Italy than on Saxony, <laughs> for instance. Just these were a bit of the two extremes. But it's interesting how the Carolingians went um, very cautiously into Italy in this sense and they settled in there uh, some of the cream of the Carolingian nobility meant uh, as the uh, counts coming from the the very core of the Frankish domains, especially of Picardy, of this area of Belgium and so on. That, uh, in fact, uh, several kings that eventually uh, also uh, came to rule over Italy after the extinction of the Carolingian dynasty descended from these Carolingian counts and so on. So part of the uh, Italian nobility in the, to the low Middle Ages stemmed from from these, um, they preferred sometimes the Carolingians preferred sometimes to let the uh, Carol the Longobard dukes to die, by uh, you know naturally, um, and to just then to set to to send another uh, to put a Frankish count in their place. So this is also the, the point. And there would be a lot else to say, but uh, I think the video is rather long <laughs> already the way it is. I just um, I will concentrate definitely on many other um, mm. topics today. We, we didn't, uh, relatively to the Longobards, today we didn't talk much about the pre-Italian phase of the Longobards. Um, and that is also very, very, very interesting and makes you understand a lot about the Longobards themselves and what they did into Italy, because uh, we hinted a bit about it, especially um, relatively to the organization, excuse me, this, um, I mean, the integration of foreign elements of the subjects and so on, but we'll see it all another time. And I hope that you like Longobard history, because actually it's very fascinating, uh, shamefully overlooked, um, and especially given the the amount of knowledge we, we have on it. Um, and this is valid for Longobard history in general. So, um, just early medieval times um, have in general this problem that is uh, quite difficult to to make people kind of um, be interested or even to think it right. 
because um, longer birth history is not just a problem here. It's here is a problem of early medieval times and even the world middle ages that people really have, on average, no idea of what they were. So I hope by you know even starting from these things that these topics that seem like details maybe, but to make you understand the 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 variety the enormous world that lays um, beyond. So okay, for now let's end it here. For uh, now I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.